Fun. If everyone can just go on mute if you're not already. Thank you. And we're live. <clears throat> <clears throat> Mr. Ready, Chairman? Mr. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure for me as the chair of the Health Policy Commission to uh, welcome you to, I think it's our fifth uh, healthcare cost growth benchmark uh, session. And uh, we're particularly pleased that we are hosting this uh, event in combination with the, um, the committees from both the House and the Senate. And I'm really pleased to uh, welcome Chair Friedman and Chair Lown. Um, I look forward to these meetings because it really sort of focuses our attention on a very important part of our uh, responsibilities, which were set in place in the 2012 uh, landmark health cost containment efforts. Um, so just um, to give you a little lay of the land, our, our, we plan today to sort of go over the latest information. Well, it's a little dated in the sense that it's, it's mostly for 2019, although we will be talking about information during the COVID 2020 as well. Uh, there won't be any votes today. Uh, this is an informational meeting. Um, following this meeting, uh, we at the Health Policy Commission will uh, look at the data, listen to the testimonies from outside people, particularly listen to the, I'm sure, very wise comments from Professor Chernow. Um, and, um, we look forward and I'm gonna turn the meeting now over to uh, our executive director, David Sells, who will give us a structural understanding of how the benchmark fits into our overall activities. So David, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, sir, um, Chair Altman and good afternoon, everyone. Um, members of the Joint Committee on Healthcare Finance, me members of the Health Policy Commission Board, uh, thank you for being here and participating in, in today's event. Um, as, as Chair Altman laid out, this is a, a really a unique event where the Health Policy Commission uh, comes together with the legislature to, to reflect on and to hear testimony uh, about the state's efforts to control healthcare spending growth. <laughs> and we do this in a very uh, data-informed way uh, to try to ensure that as we're both reflecting on the past and setting targets for the future, uh, that we're really doing a deep dive into the evidence, information, and research that can help inform how healthcare spending trends are, are progressing in the Commonwealth, those unique challenges, uh, and of course, those opportunities to create a more efficient healthcare system that works for the residents of the Commonwealth. Um, one of the really unique things about this hearing is the partnership with the, the legislature. And so at this time, I think we really want to be able to turn it over to the two chairs of uh, the Joint Committee on Healthcare Financing to introduce themselves and their members. And, and thank you members for being here. Uh, and through you, of course, to your staff uh, who do so much work. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, Representative John Lawn. Um, uh, Chair uh, on the House side of the Joint Committee to introduce yourself and your members and to say a few words. John, you're gonna to need to unmute yourself. There we go. Thank you, Dr. Altman. And thank you, David Seltz, Colleen and the HPC commissioners and staff and Ray Campbell and his team at Chia for their work in organizing this hearing today. Um, I would like to acknowledge my Senate co-chairs, uh, Senator Cynthia Friedman, and I look forward to working with her this session. I'm grateful to Speaker Mariano uh, for his trust in me and appointment as House Chair of the Healthcare Financing Committee. I know uh, his long passion and interest in Massachusetts healthcare 
policy and our collective interests and in work to address healthcare costs while also providing equity, access, and affordability. Before I go further, I would just like to acknowledge the House members who are participating today. Uh, the House of Representatives, I just want to give a heads up, is, is in session today at 1 p.m. So uh, I know we'll have some members who are in and out at today's meeting. Um, I will introduce first, though, my House Chair, Vice Chair, which is Representative Jay Livingstone of Boston, who is here. And if any other House members here, if they could please introduce themselves now, would be great. Good morning, Representative Hannah Kane. Hi, Representative Christine Barber. Representative Brian Murray, good morning. Hello, Rep Pat Duffy. I say Rep Lenny Mira. Representative Lindsay Sepidosa, good morning. Matt Miratori, Plymouth. Great, anybody else? Thank you all for being here. I appreciate you taking the time and you know we have session today, so understand when people are in and out. So thank you. Um, we are here today at the annual hearing of the state's cost growth benchmark meeting under the shadow of a generational crisis. This is a time of great uncertainty in healthcare, both locally and nationally. In the past year, the COVID pandemic revealed foundational weaknesses across the healthcare system. Nearly overnight, patient volume for routine care and procedures just stopped as providers halted operations for all but the most critical non-COVID patients. And while there has been a rebound from the bottom dropping out, the experience shed light on the structural vulnerabilities of our healthcare financing models, especially for safety net providers. The impact of the pandemic on daily life has been universal, but most for acutely felt in communities of color, bringing new attention to pervasive, unaddressed health disparities linked to social detriments of health that have been allowed to continue for far too long. The pandemic has also revealed the deficiencies in our public health infrastructure, raising awareness of the need to connect clinical care services and planning with the critical services necessary to support community health, such as disease surveillance, <laughs> prevention and wellness education, and supportive services for local populations in areas like nutrition and housing. And COVID-19 underscored the importance of recent efforts to invest in mental health services and providers. This virus set off a related mental health crisis, acutely felt among children and adolescents, and sadly, among the very same healthcare professionals who provide critical care to those infected with the virus. I watched firsthand as my wife, who was an ICU nurse, a strong, compassionate woman and mother of five children, come home broken, both physically and emotionally, after caring for our sickest residents. I know we all here salute all of our frontline healthcare workers who have risen to this enormous challenge of COVID-19. But the impacts I've just mentioned don't tell the whole story about the challenges we face in a rapidly evolving healthcare environment. They are in addition to other long simmering pressures that have been hampering our efforts to meet the promise of our historic healthcare reforms. Yes, COVID disrupted the entire healthcare economy, but it did not create every challenge we face. It only added to and emphasized those we have spent 15 years trying to address in Massachusetts in numerous health reforms. In addition to the ongoing work related to our COVID response, we must still tackle the constantly increasing cost of medical services and goods reflected in the rising premiums and out-of-pocket costs borne by families and small businesses. The financial pressures on our community hospitals and health centers are still struggling when payment systems are not changing fast enough to help them invest in the reforms we pursue. The new era of market consolidation and vertical integration that is introducing new competitors 
that transcend all geographic boundaries and regulatory structures of our traditionally local healthcare market and the operations of our legacy providers and insurers. The involving landscape in telehealth and the increase in penetration of digital platforms in patient care, which has been ongoing, but that has been seen unprecedented impact in all sectors fueled by necessity related to the COVID-19 response. These factors are just but a few of the trends in healthcare that represent significant challenges to the Commonwealth's existing healthcare reform efforts. But we must not let our efforts be deterred by either crisis or difficulty. We must move forward on the path we chose in 2012 when we established the structures to guide us toward lower overall healthcare costs, which includes setting the healthcare benchmark target. We must remain committed to this effort, pursuing integrated care, innovating with value-based coverage, expanding prevention and community-based care, while also tackling, tackling costs. We need to continually push the system forward for great efficiency and effectiveness. There is much work to do and deciding where to set the benchmark for the next calendar year is just one piece of the puzzle. I look forward to working this session with all my colleagues on the Joint Committee on Healthcare Financing and within the House of Representatives on implementing policies in support of the delivery and payment reforms that shift the focus of healthcare system to meet the needs of patients and ease the burdens borne by individuals, families, and small businesses. A healthcare system that builds upon the principles of shared responsibility, that informs the reforms of our past to create a health system that we need for our future. One built to be more equitable, accessible, and sustainable for everyone in our commonwealth. I look forward to the opportunity to address you, and I look forward to working collaboratively with all of you. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Representative, and, and we look forward to collaborating uh, with you as well. Um, on behalf of uh, Stuart, did you want to jump in? No, that's. Uh, I was just uh, just wondering whether the Chair Friedman has joined us. I have. Oh, great! Good to see you. <laughs> Good to see you. I'm sorry, my had uh, technical di difficulties. Well, I understand that well. <laughs> um, so. Um, Thank you so much, Dr. Altman. It's good to see you and David and the board and staff of the Health Policy Commission. Um, in case you don't know me, I'm Senator Cindy Friedman and I co-chair the Joint Committee on Healthcare Financing. Um, I'm glad to see you all. I'm going to see my co-chair, uh, Rep. Lawn, um, Ray Campbell, and um, the Center for uh, Health Information and Analysis. Um, and I'm really looking forward to our guest speaker. Um, and uh, I just wanna welcome all the patient advocates, healthcare providers and health plans who've joined us today to participate in this very important discussion. Um, Cause as we know, and as you've heard this, this topic and has implications for every single person in the Commonwealth. Um, so I am really looking forward to hearing from HPC and from Chia and from the healthcare stakeholders today, as we review how we measured up against the met benchmark, which as you will hear, has not been very good. And as we consider modifications to the benchmark going forward, um, as you heard from Rep. Lawn, we are at a critical point, especially after the last year when many of our residents struggled to keep their jobs and put food on the table, the increase in healthcare costs could not come at a more difficult time. We know that many have and are putting off healthcare simply because they cannot afford the cost and high deductible health plans are rising, meaning even more out-of-pocket costs for members. This will not make healthcare more accessible, and in fact, it has the opposite result for many. So I will be really interested in hearing more about the major drivers behind our failure to meet the benchmark in 2019, including pharmaceutical and hospital spending, and understanding how this increase specifically impacts access and costs for our residents, for as we all can agree, we absolutely cannot, nor should we continue to shift rising costs onto already struggling working people and their families. 
So I look forward to working with many of you in the weeks and months ahead on these important issues of healthcare costs, access, and quality, issues made all the more critical during this COVID-19 pandemic and as we emerge on the other side. So again, welcome, and let me acknowledge my Senate colleagues on the Joint Committee on Healthcare Financing who are with us today. Um, I have seen uh, Vice Chair and Senate President Emera, Emerita Harriet Chandler. Um, hello to Senator Keenan, Senator Feeney. Um, Senator Lesser will be joining us. Um, I did not see Senator Sear or Senator O'Connor. Um, they may be joining us late. Um, so again, thank you so much. And back to you, Dr. Altman and David. Thank you so much, um, uh, Senator Friedman. So um, we're gonna move forward because we're all very excited about listening to our guest speaker, uh, Professor Michael Chernow, who I think we all know, but if you don't, if there is one person in this country who represents what I consider to be the best of the combination of analytical capacities and an understanding of our healthcare system and working to make it work better for everyone. Uh, Professor Chernow is the Leonard Davis Professor of Health Policy uh, at the Harvard School of Public Health and Medicine. Um, and uh, he has been a very active um, promoter of as many of you pointed out, quality health care. Recently, he was named the chair of the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, or as we fondly talk about it, MedPAC, uh, which takes on many of the responsibilities that we have here in Massachusetts uh, for the federal government. I know uh, Professor Chernow has a, uh, a meeting that he needs to go to so I won't go into his background, but I would say one thing in terms of all the things he's published. If any of you get a chance, he, he provided us with some of his latest publications. Read them. They are in, in sh the most focused effort on the complexity of how our healthcare system operates. So it really is a pleasure for me to introduce Professor Michael Chernow. Mike? Great, um, uh, Chairman Altman. Uh, first of all, thank you for the generous introduction. And I wanna thank you and the members and staff of the Health Policy Commission. Um, I'd like to uh, thank Senator Friedman and Representative Lawn and all the uh, state legislators that are joining us today, um, not only for having me, and I really am honored to be here and I will uh, answer uh, every question you have until you're done. Um, but also I wanna thank you all for everything that you do to help make healthcare better in the Commonwealth. Um, I told David Cutler when he rotated off the Harvard Benefits Committee and joined the Health Policy Commission that now he was gonna have a bigger impact on what happens uh, at Harvard than he would have from the Benefits Committee. You're in a really important position. So um, I was asked today to talk about uh, the role of prices in healthcare spending growth. So that's what I'm gonna do. Um, we can move to the next slide, I guess. Um, I, yeah, I think, so I, I know you know this, but I just wanna emphasize um, the importance of controlling healthcare spending. Um, it obviously strains uh, public budgets. I will emphasize that uh, the state, of course, ensures a lot of people through the state, uh, state workers, through the GIC and places like that. And so it's a, you, the state is also a, um, employer a purchaser as opposed to just controlling the healthcare system uh, in the state. Um, when healthcare spending rises, it puts downward pressure on wages. And by the way, that has a uh, impact on tax revenues because of the differential treatment of health benefits and wages. Um, it distorts the labor market. I think you probably hear a lot from employers that are very frustrated with high um, healthcare spending and health insurance premiums and high uh, health insurance uh, spending or high healthcare spending overall encourages less generous insurance coverage, which both imposes risks on individuals, make them pay a lot out of pocket, and discourages the use of needed care. And um, you know, no one wakes up in the morning wanting to um, 
shift more of the burden for healthcare onto individuals or workers. But as healthcare spending increases, we see more and more of that shift. And there's a lot of deleterious consequences associated with that. So controlling healthcare spending, I really think is a fundamental challenge faced uh, in Massachusetts and for that matter, all states and in the country. Um, and so I wanna talk a bit about one approach to addressing it, but I don't wanna uh, gloss over the fact about how important your task is. So next slide. So this is a really basic model of healthcare spending. Um, very simply, healthcare spending is a function of prices and utilization, both of which are a function of competition in the provider space and a competition, uh, competition in the insurer space. And together, they play into health insurance premiums. And so I'm going to say something in a moment about utilization, but most of my talk today is going to be about that upper box on prices. So the next slide. So um, with regards to utilization, it's a little bit tricky because you don't want utilization to go too low. The, the sort of upside of utilization is essentially access. So what we're really trying to do when we address utilization is to reduce low value care, care that isn't providing um, beneficial health. And there is actually an unfortunately large amount of care in the healthcare system that could be characterized as low value care. And there's a growing uh, movement both in academia and outside of academia to address this type of low value care. Um, you'll see some work done by my colleagues at Michigan on top and then some uh, Atul Gawande and Kerry Cole from Dartmouth and so another colleague of mine, Bruce Landon, um, did, a work, did some work on this. And then there's some other work uh, below, but this is really just a smattering of the research going on in low value care. And I really do encourage you to think about strategies to reduce the amount of low value care delivered to patients in the Commonwealth. Um, that includes measuring it. Uh, it includes alternative payment models, a bunch of things that I unfortunately am not gonna talk a lot about today, but I am always willing to come back. Can we go to the next slide? Um, Instead, what I'm really gonna focus on is prices. So the re reduced utilization is important. I don't wanna diminish its importance. And I, since I never actually catch a fish, that looks like a big fish to me on the left. Um, but the real big game in town is often prices. So we can go to the next slide. Um, this is some work from HCCI, but I think, I, I haven't seen the data in Massachusetts. I think the uh, data you may see today will uh, be Massachusetts specific. And I give a lot of credit to Chia and the Health Policy Commission for coming up with that data. But at least nationally from HCCI, uh, if you look on the left, the top lines that are solid, those are all price increases. The bottom lines that are dashed, those are all quantity increases. So the real game that's going on here, the real issue is prices are rising a lot more quickly than volume. And this is why there's been so much attention on prices in trying to address healthcare spending growth. Now I might add, there is a concern and, and Stuart mentioned this at the beginning about people's interest in quality. And I certainly share that interest. A lot of the work I've done has been on how to preserve high quality care. It's important to point out that um, Although the evidence on this is hard to get at, it is really, in my opinion, unlikely that quality is what's justifying these high prices and this high, these high price increases. And so that's why people are trying to figure out how to begin to address the price problem, because we aren't really convinced that when prices go up, we're getting quality to justify it. Can we go to the next slide? Um, so uh, the the... As an economist, I think it is clear, but I suspect everybody realizes this, the problem with healthcare markets are ubiquitous. And you should know, I'm a reasonably free market guy, um, but finding problems in the healthcare sector is like shooting fish in a barrel. Um, on the right of this slide, you see President Bush giving a, a, a congressional medal to, uh, I just asked a quiz about who that is, uh, David Cutler will get it. It's Ken Arrow, um, Nobel laureate, and really did some of the seminal work on problems in the healthcare markets, consolidation of providers, insurance distortions, including consolidation of insurers, um, adverse selection issues, um, inability to observe quality. It's hard to know what you wanna buy if you can't really observe the quality of it. And broadly speaking, failures of agency. That means that people are acting in their own interests, not necessarily in the interests uh, of the patients in a, in a bunch of different ways. So I'm not gonna go through all of those. I say that largely to say that while I am a broad supporter of markets 
there's a lot of failures. Uh, can we go to the next slide? So I'm not gonna name these two kids on the left, but um, the point is even wonderful things that I mentioned I'm a proponent of markets need guidance. And that's really what I'm gonna talk largely about today, how we might be able to help healthcare markets, which we basically like, perform a little better given the challenges that we face. So we can go to the next slide. So I'm really going to talk about very few of these, but I want to be a little bit comprehensive in the type of options folks face. And I'm happy to talk about others. My font was getting small, so I had to limit what I was going to say. So the first one is to promote competition. And again, I am a big supporter of promoting competition. Um, unfortunately, evidence suggests that the impact of that has been slow and there's been a bit of unproven success. So I am I know the Health Policy Commission has weighed in on a number of related issues in the state. I think that is very important. I think we have a lot of concerns about the failure of competition across the country and in particular markets, but strategies to get at that and improve competition have been hard to come by. And frankly, my personal opinion was really trying to prevent it from getting worse. Maybe we'll be able to make it a little better, but um, I don't think you're going to get a quick fix from any of the strategies I've seen that fall broadly under the category of promote competition. In a lot of places that I, uh, a lot of circles that I run in, people talk about the public option. Again, the public option is one of those things, it's a bit of a Rorschach test because it means different things to different people um, and the details absolutely matter. So uh, maybe the phrase the public option should be banned. But in any case, um, it's a, typically speaking, it's a very blunt instrument. It can create a lot of market distortions because it can create big gaps between the um, coverage and the prices that frankly are paid for some people versus others. And depending on exactly how you implement it, it can result in very, very large price cuts to providers, which you may view as a good thing. I have to tell you, honestly, I am concerned about such large price cuts as would be implied by a public option, again, depending on the details. Um, a lot of folks talk about setting prices. I am not a fan of setting prices. That is, I actually should have said, I'm speaking in my role as a professor, not as my role of uh, the chair of MedPAC. So that seems ironic. I'm not a fan, broadly speaking, uh, of the government setting prices in commercial markets. It can be quite heavy handed. And in many cases, depending on what you do, you're gonna raise the prices for some providers. And it's very hard, I say this with some experience, to actually get the prices right. Um, so where I tend to be, at least in the commercial sector, and where I'm going to talk now, is sort of eliminating some of the blatant market failures. Broadly speaking, um, in the nation, we had a big problem with surprise billing. I think that's been less of a problem in Massachusetts, and the, uh, there's been some legislative changes recently to go after surprise billing. But the problem of high prices is much, 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 much more than simply surprise billing. I call it excessive prices in quotes because excessive is a bit in the eye of the beholder. But the point is, there are some um, really high prices that are being charged. And I'm going to spend most of the rest of my time talking about how one might go after those or address those. So next slide. So I have a proposal with a colleague, uh, Limor Daphne, you may know, if not, you should, uh, and a, a student, Max Pawnee, who's terrific, that we put together for the Hamilton Project, which is run by the Brookings Institute. Um, they really had three prongs of approaches to control prices. The first one was the cap fee for service prices, basically cut off the very top uh, of the uh, mountain of high prices. The second one is to cap price growth. Um, you see this in some places, Rhode Island. I, I'm not an expert on Rhode Island. I can discuss it briefly. And then the third prong was flexible oversight. And I will say something at the end of this about how complicated oversight is, although I will say Massachusetts is about as well suited with Health Policy Commission to do that type of uh, uh, analysis than most other states. Next slide. So a few details. Um, my personal view is that commercial prices should be capped um, broadly as a function of commercial prices, local or adjusted national prices. Um, and just so you know, in our proposal, we talked about five times uh, the 20th percentile, which works out to roughly five times Medicare, but it's really based on commercial prices. So it's really getting about the top five to 10% of prices. Um, there's another option to use the Medicare prices, your reference. 
I am not a huge fan of that for reasons we could talk about, but it is certainly where I think most states that I've talked about are thinking about, largely for reasons of administrative simplicity. Um, there's another issue that you could limit this to all out of net to out of network care, which is a lighter touch. It might be more politically appealing, although I won't tell you what's politically appealing. Um, and it may well spill over to in network care. So um, it, it is sort of a starting place if you want to limit to out of network care. The last thing I'll say is I don't advocate prices be the same for all providers in the Commonwealth, but I do think given the disparities we have now, allowing somewhat faster growth for low price providers could be a wise thing to do. Um, you don't want to lock in the existing price disparities across the providers, and I'm sure you've seen a lot of evidence on the existing price disparities. Uh, next slide. So um, I'll just say a few things about the implementation uh, considerations, and then I will open it up, uh, open it up for questions. So a few things that I like about an approach like this. The first one is the caps can be adjusted and they nibble at the top. I don't know exactly um, what would happen if you made really dramatic changes to prices that would be implied through broad things like really expansive public options where you could see really dramatic revenue reductions in the provider uh, space. And I'm not sure how that would affect care. I'm not sure how it would affect employment. I'm not sure how it would affect access. There's a range of things like that that matter. With CAPS, it allows you to adjust and to nibble at the top and see where you go. You can decide how aggressive you do or don't want to be based on where you are in terms of the targets, but you're not locked into a really dramatic impact. It allows you this type of regulation um, to drill down in specific aspects of the contract at the contract provider level. So you can avoid situations where one group says, well, you know, give us a higher price because you can take it out of someone else's uh, price. It really creates a, a, at least a backstop in, in the work that we've done with uh, Max and Lee Moore, we call it backstop price regulation against some of the more egregious challenges to pricing uh, given where we are in the market. Um, and it gives you that sort of ability to focus on a specific thing. Um, when you focus on spending overall, which I realize is the ultimate target, sometimes you run into a problem about knowing where within that spending you actually want to target. And this takes a portion of it and tries to put some uh, backstop there. Um, I will freely admit, in fact, the part that keeps me up at night broadly is how you will enforce this. There's not necessarily standard pricing approaches. So when someone talks about capping prices or capping price growth, that becomes problematic if some people are paying uh, by the CPT, others are paying by the APC, which is an outpatient bundling mechanism. Some are paying per diem for hospitals, others might be paying DRGs. It's very hard to figure out what you're actually doing if price is taking many different forms. It's also important to understand there's a lot of money that is flowing outside of the claim system uh, through performance bonuses and a series of other things. Alternative payment models, which I'm an enormous supporter of, uh, give bonuses, for example. Sometimes those bonuses flow outside of the payment system, and so you might not see them. In other places, Rhode Island, for example, there really is a strong role for actuaries in thinking through the enforcement of this. Um, there's a series of ERISA issues. What can you do? Um, given some of the concerns around ERISA. I'm not a lawyer, so I won't answer that. There's been places where folks have gotten around it, but it certainly is a concern about how to deal with this in the self-insured versus the fully insured market. Um, and then there's a bunch of other operational things that become problematic, like shifting price increases to services where there's room under the cap. And um, again, this is why both the price growth cap becomes important and the sort of flexible enforcement matters. So this is by no means uh, an easy lift, but I think beginning to think about how to uh, affect prices, particularly at the upper end, is one way to think about solving the big problem. Because my guess is, and I, I'm sorry I'm going to have to run, uh, but my guess is a lot of what you see in Massachusetts is also going to be focused on prices. And so sort of a broad theme here is just getting a little stronger, a little more aggressive tools to help begin to address that type of problem. Um, I, I do want to emphasize, and um, I think Representative Long emphasized this really well in the introductory remarks, um, often when you take the view that I've just taken, there is some uh, inference that you're not supportive of the work that the providers do. 
So I will add, I was unbelievably supportive of the work that providers do before COVID. And uh, we don't call the providers heroes for nothing in the face of the pandemic and what they have done. And I believe it is important for a variety of reasons to uh, be careful about how aggressive we go after the revenue of providers given all that they have faced. And this is sort of the core conundrum. The um, introduction to my talk emphasized how important, important it was to both control spending and spending growth and how important prices were in driving that spending growth. That said, you want to go after them in a way that is as least disruptive to the market and access and a bunch of other things you will care about. And I believe that a sort of regulatory approach can allow you the tools to achieve that balance, but you should not assume you can just slash provider revenues and end up with the same healthcare system that we have now. I would encourage you to both move, but move judiciously. Um, the last thing that I think is important, and again, I haven't spoken about this much because I focus on the price of care. It is important to make sure that the uh, savings are passed on to consumers in a range of ways. There are rules like the medical loss ratio rules that do support that. But um, as you go forward, it's important to understand that the savings uh, ultimately should go to the public. Um, that's, I think, the ultimate goal. And I think that can be accomplished through price regulation, but certainly that is not the end of the story. So that's uh, my overall um, presentation. And I look forward to any questions and I appreciate your uh, listening. Thank you so much, Michael. So let me build uh, on your uh, almost last comment about how, how much we uh, should be thinking about reducing revenue to our provider community. And I know you have this in your Hamilton project, but give us a flavor for how much of a reduction in revenue would occur if we use Medicare for everybody versus how much of a reduction in revenue would occur if we followed the outlines of what you talked about with the 20th percentile. So again, it very much depends on the details. If you did a Medicare for all type approach, so it's not just using Medicare as a reference price, but using Med but really setting the prices at Medicare and setting it for everybody, um, depending somewhat on what that's doing to Medicaid in your state, because that could, in some states, that increases uh, Medicaid uh, reimbursements. But overall, you could be talking about a easy double digit, maybe 20%. Again, I'm, I can't speak to Massachusetts per se, reduction in revenue to providers. Um, again, it depends on the type of provider, um, but it can be quite uh, quite large. In, in nationally, and I can't speak to Massachusetts, um, Medicare prices are roughly twice, uh, I'm sorry, commercial prices are roughly twice Medicare. So you're basically cutting uh, uh, the commercial prices in half, at least for hospitals, and if you think the commercial prices, I'll just pick a number again, I don't know in Massachusetts, are 30% of the revenues. My guess is they're a little more, but just to do the math, you're basically gonna get a 15% revenue reduction. Um, and of course, if the commercial revenues are a higher share more, if the prices in Massachusetts are higher than double more, um, I would defer to others on the uh, Zoom as to what it would do in Massachusetts. But the point is it really could be a pretty significant reduction and um, the other thing I would say about that is you're, you're tying yourself now to Medicare pricing. If you do what we said, it depends on where the caps are set. What we propose, which is really close to five times Medicare, although we were doing it as a function of commercial prices, you're really talking more about um, five or six percent of the commercial spend. So it's an even smaller share of overall spend. Um, and I really think that's valuable, but it's focusing on the growth that matters most. So let me now turn it over to others. Um, again, if you'll use the chat uh, and raise your hand, uh, Colleen uh, will uh, let me know who is in the group and I will then call you. So Colleen, do we have any questions? Because I can ask a whole bunch of them, but I <laughs> We do, we're gonna start with Representative Barber has a question for Dr. Chernow. Uh, thanks Colleen, uh, thanks. Chairpersons, um, and thanks, Dr. Turnu. I really appreciate the presentation today. Um, question on what I think was your last point. Um, these 
are really challenging changes to make. And the goal is to make sure that we are reducing premiums and reducing costs to small businesses and to families um, on the ground. And I, I know with a lot of the big system costs that can be really hard to actually do and get into the pockets of, of, of people on the ground. Um, like we have a really strong medical loss ratio in Massachusetts um, and that hasn't always um, been, you know, I don't know that there's much more we can do on that, but if you have other ideas in that realm, that would be really helpful. Well, uh, so Massachusetts does have more stringent medical loss ratio requirements, my understanding is anyway, compared to the national ACA requirements. Um, COVID has made things very challenging in a bunch of ways, but some of that uh, hopefully will help. I actually, I, I agree with you for the most part. I, um, I don't see a ton of mileage in the long run coming out of medical loss ratios. Again, if you focus on the growth in spending as opposed to the level of spending, the medical loss ratio sort of controls the ratio of total spend, total medical spending to kind of premiums. But the growth over time is broadly not been in a deterioration of the medical loss ratio as much as an increase in medical spend. And as I showed you again, I think, um, uh, you'll see later in this meeting, although I haven't seen the exact numbers, I think you're going to see similarly in the Commonwealth that a lot of that growth is in prices. And so the real challenge is to control that rate of growth. And the beauty of controlling the rate of growth is, you know, you know you're going to set the price tar the um, spending targets. You're not setting the spending targets at GDP minus two or something, I'm assuming you're not, something very aggressive. Historically, I think you actually have some limits. Historically, the spending targets have been set in a way that allows revenue into the system to go up. You're just limiting how much that is. So I think you can, uh, the type of things I'm talking about, um, I'm much more worried about being accused of being too wimpy than being too aggressive. Um, and I do think a focus on the underlying medical spend is probably what the long run success is going to require. And, and the MLR will help you. I don't think that the MLR is going to really solve your problems um, in a world of rising medical spending. So let me, before I um, uh, ask uh, Professor Cutler for his comments, let me remind everyone in the audience and particularly our legislative colleagues <clears throat> that the rules that were set up in 2012 created in the Commonwealth what I would call a soft or a nuanced regulatory structure in the sense that we will be talking today about a benchmark that we want to see to keep growth under, we've been trying to do that under 3.1 or 3.6%, but we do not have any regulatory controls on prices. And so we have to rely on the bully pulpit uh, to sort of get our system in line. And we're gonna talk about how successful we've been. So for us to move to what Professor Chernow talked about would require the legislature to sort of change the rules of the game. I just wanna remind people where we are in the Commonwealth. With that said, Professor Cutler, I uh, welcome your comments. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Michael. That was uh, just terrific. I actually wanted to ask you a question along the lines of what Stuart uh, said, because I think Stuart's thinking was exactly right. Do you think we as a Commonwealth should contemplate um, adding to what we have now a kind of price cap component? Or, or we can make recommendations to the legislature as a Commission that the Health Policy Commission should recommend adding a price cap component, or do you think we should add more teeth to what we have now? Like, what? How would you? How would you? What? What advice would you give us? Yeah. So the, the short answer to your question is yes, um, but I'm not really much for short answers. So um, I don't view it as an either or. Although I do think you need, at a minimum, more focus on the price portion of things. And one can debate how one, uh, how much authority different people have to enforce uh, hard or soft caps and what's going on. You, I, I call Massachusetts, and I, I hope this is um, 
taken a, a, a little bit as a, a joke, but partly true, is we have a, a targets, hope, and shame strategy. Um, there are some uh, things you can do uh, given the authority you have in terms of performance improvement plans, I understand, but I actually think a little more heft behind contracts that have high prices or rapidly growing prices would be useful, whether it triggers something soft like a, a performance improvement plan or it triggers a more strict uh, legislative action is a, a broader question I'm particularly prepared to ask, to answer. But if I were asked um, uh, in a nutshell, I would push towards a stronger, uh, a stronger version to get rid of the more extreme uh, pricing problems. Thank you so much. That's a, uh, let me now turn to uh, uh, Dr. Berwick, a member of our Health Policy Commission. Thanks, Stuart, and thank you. Um, thank you, uh, uh, um, Mike, that, that you're, as always, just, just a masterful uh, summary. Um, I, I wanna zoom out for a minute here. There seems to me to be a continuing chronic, almost decade long disjunction here that I'd love your thoughts about. The evidence that you again recited about the price problem, the cost problem, the the, the pain that uh, that Representative Lawn accounted uh, recounted the the tremendous pressure on small businesses, uh, the um, the low value care prevalence that you cited, strong evidence, some of which I've contributed to, that we have high levels of waste in care, and inter and you didn't mention international comparative prices or costs. Um, we have a lot of pain, a lot of opportunity, and just marginal gains. And, and there, there just strikes me that the, we ought to be able to do a much bigger fix than we're talking about. I think there's a lack of will. I think we talk about reducing prices and costs. Uh, we know that we can do that without impairing quality, but we don't act. Uh, you've been living in this world for a long time. Do you have any comments on will building here that, uh, or are we going to continue to do uh, well, speaking dials? Yeah. Well, first of all, if you're ever asked to testify in front of the health policy commission, you should always do that. And if you're ever asked to testify in front of the health policy commission, you should always start with the uh, recognition of the imperative for some type of action. Um, my personal view, and um, you know, Don, you know the details of care delivery in the underlying processes uh, in order of magnitude better than I do, but my general view in terms of political will in some ways, and this is a choice that has to be made, is either you can go very big uh, uh, with very strong things and you're not sure how they're all gonna play out, or you can set up a process that I've outlined that is maybe a little easier to swallow, but admittedly not as impactful, certainly not to start. I have tended to be, and this is a little bit more of my personality, tending to be of the belief that uh, let's put in place the structures that will enable us to evolve and improve the system over time as opposed to dramatically change the system in part because it's politically harder to make a revolutionary change and in part because quite frankly I'm less sure where the revolutionary change is going to get us. I don't think there's much you can do that can make us look like any of the other countries in the international comparisons um, although those international comparisons are indeed humbling. Um, so uh, again there's a pathway portion of this which uh, frankly um, I said this about surprise billing. Uh, I, surprise billing was one of these things which was a blatant problem that should have been fixed in like a weekend. That's a bit of an exaggeration. I'm kind of joking, but fixed relatively uh, quickly. It took years to fix surprise billing and surprise billing was a small part of the problem. So, um, and, and I think there's much more work to be done. So I think in this case, I agree with you it is hard to move and it's hard to move because you're balancing a bunch of competing things and a bunch of unknowns. So my general view is instead of being paralyzed by not knowing exactly how big to go, start the journey and start it with a, uh, start it on a path that will allow you to adjust it and progress over time. That's, that's my economist view of how to build uh, 
uh, movement forward, but it is admittedly frustrating to people more visionary like yourself. Uh, let me now turn to Commissioner Tim Foley. Tim? Thank you. And uh, definitely <laughs> not as a visionary question as was raised before, uh, but um, just honing in on one piece of your presentation of the outlines of uh, way forward that you've presented, particularly around the one notion of allowing lower cost providers to grow at a faster rate than higher cost providers and relating that to your comment about what the tools we currently have is the cost to market impact review. Uh, but we just, everyone starts at the same point for that. So uh, if you're low cost, you get triggered, your high cost, you get triggered. And just wonder if you could talk a little bit more about how you see um, the tools that we have now within that uh, approach around a lower cost providers growing at a higher rate. Um, and how does that fit into your overall structure of ways we might, might want to think about um, your, the system as you, as you uh, laid out? Sure. And I, I see uh, Secretary Sutter's joining us. So hello. Um, I only see like five of you on my screen, by the way. Um, yeah, so this is one of the more challenging things to do. You don't want to um, overpay people if you don't need to overpay, but understand we're paying for access. And I think many people, and I don't have the details exactly in Massachusetts, would argue that there's a lot of population served by low price providers that are very important. And it is uh, difficult to apply across the board policies because of the differences in where their providers are. So my general view would be to allow somewhat more generous uh, revenue growth, if you will, at the lower end, somewhat more generous price growth at the lower end and be a little stricter at the top end. This is where the price caps, for example, only hit the top end. They don't hit the lower end at all. They're, they're structured that way intentionally. And my uh, view is, and again, I think this is one of the merits of Massachusetts's flexible approach is you can balance what you really want because it's access and quality with the cost savings you need. So I think as you translate the data that gets presented to you into action, allowing um, revenue growth or price growth in places where you need to encourage access to high quality care is the right thing to do. And some flexibility there matters. Um, I will emphasize that even at the upper end, what we've proposed is really a slowdown in growth with the exception of the very, very top where you'd be cutting off the level. Most of it is just a slowdown in growth. And I think you would find most providers uh, when you add it all up would see a, a slowdown in the growth of revenue, not an actual reduction. And I think that's important both for the political question that um, Don asked, but also what you're doing is you're basically allowing some of the folks at the uh, lower end to, um, continue to grow and provide a certain amount of access provided you need that access. Um, uh, and the worst case scenario, of course, would be if the growth was the uh, fastest, if the uh, places that were um, already the highest and the least need of more revenue to provide what you're looking for. So again, I would defer to the uh, staff of the Health Policy Commission to go through the details of that in Massachusetts, but I do think it's important to have that flexibility to recognize there's tremendous heterogeneity across providers. And I might add, and I didn't get a lot of time to talk about this, um, I focus mostly on you know, hospital and less so physician services, but there's a lot of stuff going on in post-acute care. So it's not just providers, it's also provider types. Um, a lot of stuff going on in behavioral health. There's a lot of areas. I'm not talking much about drugs here and hopefully my time will end before you ask me about it. But um, there's a lot of different types of providers uh, where different policies are needed. And I think you have to remember that what you're really trying to do is allow revenue to grow in places where you need that growth to support access and quality. And you're trying to constrain it in the places where you think there's more wasteful spending or prices that are higher than they need to be to get the access and quality that you need. That's a good point. I'd like to turn it now to, uh, to Representative Lenny Mera. Representative Thank you for that. Appreciate the time. Yeah, the thing that confounds me the most, the thing that really astounds me, Michael, is, is price disparities when I look into this. Um, they just seem to grow year for year. And so the hospital near me is the Anna Jake's right in report. They can do knee replacements, hip replacements um, for tens of thousands of dollars less than, the, than those big teaching hospitals down in Boston. And the outcomes 
the data shows is every bit as good, if not better, than those big teaching hospitals in Boston. Um, so my question, you know, rather rudimentary, is why do these disparities exist and why do they persist? Because if a person could save tens of thousands of dollars on a knee replacement, why are they not going to Anna Jigs? Someone is paying for that. And of course, the someone is typically an insurance company. So my question is, why are not insurance companies doing a better job of getting their patients, their customers uh, to go to these community hospitals like Anna Jigs? What is the reason behind that? Yeah, so um, interestingly, my, my meeting after this, and I'm happy to stay a little bit longer, is at the Harvard Benefits Committee, which I uh, have the honor of chairing, and we think a lot about this question. There's a bunch of complicated reasons. Some of it has to do with the consolidation um, uh, and how primary care doctors set up in networks. Some of it has to do with insurance policies that don't encourage that type of shifting. Some of it has to do with employers not wanting to adopt insurance policies that encourage that kind of shifting on the, uh, the connector, which I, I know well, I, I sit on the connector board. Um, you see a lot of narrow network plans. You don't see them in the commercial market. Employers have not been very aggressive. Um, employers, some are aggressive. Many times the employers don't wanna interfere with established patient provider relationships, or they don't wanna be perceived as interfering with where an employee may wanna go or the employee's doctor may wanna send them. Um, there are a lot of policies in the market. I will tell you that every insurer I know has some plan that an employer could buy if they wanted to that would be more aggressive in, ste in steering. We did an evaluation of the tiered network product that uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts offered. We found about a 5% saving there. They moved a modest number of the pa patients. If you move to even stronger proposals like reference pricing insurance designs, you could probably move even more. There's been a hesitancy on the consumer side to adopt those types of things. And that's why the uh, progress has been slow. I might add, um, I'm not sure if this is subtext of your question. There's a bunch of people um, who argue that if we just have more price transparency, then everybody will shop. And that is uh, I think a wonderful idea and simply has not been shown to be true. Um, in some work that we've done uh, nationally, we found for MRIs, people passed six lower priced MRI pr places before they, they, they drove past them, um, at least drove further than them to get to the place where they went. And a lot of it's just because of where the physicians were referring. Um, in, in payment reform models like the alternative quality contract, you actually found physicians did a better job of shopping. But given the nature of the way systems are consolidated, it's very hard to uh, capture those savings that you talk about, um, but those savings actually are quite large. And I might add, if you had a market that worked even stronger, you would end up um, not only shifting where people got care, but you would probably end up bringing down the price of care at those high price places. We just haven't yet figured out the policies to make that happen. No, I agree with you. If we could figure out a way, it, it would bring down prices. Absolutely. Just and I spent a lot of my I spent a lot of my time trying to find ways to do that. Um, uh, so I guess that just makes me well. Uh, as a former employer, I mean, I had a company with 120 guys on payroll. You know, there was one insurance policy offered. It was X. It was Blue Cross or if it was Tufts, whatever. Um, I don't recall them there being a lot of choice. And of course, yeah, we had to have, you know, Mass General in that you know, system, or we, you know, couldn't get our employees on it. But um, it just seems like there has to be a better mechanism, Michael, to, to give consumers that ultimate choice, because there is a lot of savings to be had there. I mean, yeah, like I said, if, they go to the, if they go to the connector, of course, they can get that choice. But um, of course, there's issues about getting to the connector. But the point, but the point remains that almost every insurer in the state, every in, in the insurer, the state that I know will sell a policy that has a tiered or narrow network if people want to buy it. So I think this is less about getting the insurers to build those things and more about getting customers to want to buy them. Um, uh, there's been a ton of advances uh, in the evolution of these policies. Um, the GIC um, has been a leader in some of these types of tiered policies as well, by the way. Um, but uh, it, it remains a, uh, a goal. I just um, share some of your frustration that we haven't moved further along now. You know, uh, Michael, I'd love to keep you for uh, the next hour. Um, do you have time for one more question? Absolutely. Or? All right. I'll have time for two more questions. All Michael. right. I love it. All right. Uh, Representative Kane, I know you are next. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for this uh, presentation this morning. 
So one of the, the questions that I have is, you know, when you say that there is um, additional sort of uh, pricing at the top, I assume that's translating to profit, right? Do we have a sense of where that's going then? Like what happens with these dollars that are, are being paid out? Is that, because I will tell you that one of the concerns that I have is relative to um, how much of that additional profit is then being used to fuel uh, further competition for those commercial paying dollars and, and moving into markets where, uh, you know, there are certain healthcare institutions that rely on having a, a, some commercial paying to offset the high amount of public payer that they have. Can you speak to that at all? Yeah, so this is a really challenging question. First, of course, many of the providers we're talking about are nonprofit. So it really flows to somewhere like surplus. And of course, expenses are kind of flexible. So it might look, it's very hard to know from an accounting sense where all of the um, uh, where all of the money is flowing in terms of where it needs to flow for lack of a better word. Many of the organizations of course have very public facing missions. They do a lot of good things. Um, so it's difficult to go into uh, the accounting and try and figure out exactly what is or isn't justified, which is one reason why I tend to uh, favor nibbling at the top and seeing what happens as you begin to push down um, understand where the money comes from and what you're losing. But your point about differences in providers and some have a lot of commercial and some don't have as much commercial revenue is spot on. And of course, some of them are getting a lot more from the same commercial payers um, because of their position in the market. And so this gets back to the point about where the cap should be set and what cap growth should be uh, to support that because you do want to make sure. I'm not one that believes that no one should ever close or that every uh, provider we have in the state now needs to uh, exist for the next 50 years. But I do think you have to be very cognizant of the providers that are providing the services or the populations that are really needed and manage this in a way that doesn't disadvantage them. Because again, what you're really trying to do is to set up a system that provides access to high quality care. And for some of the providers serving more of the more disadvantaged populations, you have to make sure that you don't cut off the top of any commercial revenue they're getting. I will tell you nationally, the providers that are charging super high commercial prices tend not to be the providers uh, um, uh, that are serving disproportionately um, all the low income patients or the, um, that doesn't mean they don't serve a lot of them, by the way, they absolutely do. But some of the providers you're most worried about are not the ones charging the highest prices. Uh, uh, Chris Kider, uh, did you, would you like to make a comment or question? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Stuart. Uh, I, and, and thank you, Professor uh, Chernow. I, I, I'm, uh, I wanted to make a point about uh, a continuing theme here, which is about bringing down prices, which uh, as Stuart pointed out, is not uh, in the charter of the HPC. We are responsible for doing the best we can to bring down costs, which is different than prices. Uh, caps, uh, and I, I apologize to the economists because I'm, I'm no economist, but capping prices often leads to increased volume. Uh, and we, I, I think that that's a, an axiom. Um, the word capitation has not come up in this discussion. Uh, and uh, capitation, I think, has been demonstrated to be a very effective uh, tool, um, even in Massachusetts, uh, where we see far lower uh, uh, incidents uh, of low value procedures uh, coming from groups uh, that provide, uh, that have capitated contracts. So can you make a, a general comment uh, about capitation? Uh, rec and, and by the way, I'm the primary care rep on the uh, HPC and uh, you know, cognitive care, which is what fundamentally what, pri what primary care does, non-procedural care um, has uh, been uh, shortchanged for 40 years because fixed prices in Medicare going all the way back to 1969 or 1970, a far overvalued uh, procedural care rather than uh, cognitive care. So behavioral care and primary care have been 
uh, losing talent for, um, for many, many years because of the attraction of fixed prices uh, in uh, Medicare procedures. So the, the last point there is we, we do have a value-based care contracts um, but those tend to piggyback on fee-for-service and have had really minimal uh, impact. So in, in talking about capping prices and bringing down prices, aren't we talking about just keeping the fee-for-service system the way, they, way it is rather than moving to uh, capitated models? So first, thank you for your question. I'll try and be brief. Um, maybe in the order of which you said things, because that's the order in which I took notes. Um, there has been a long literature on uh, the volume responses to reduced prices. Almost none of that has been uh, done in areas where you're capping prices at the top. Um, it's almost all been when folks are really setting prices. Um, so we don't know a ton about the quantity of responses. I think that is true. Um, uh, I think with modest price caps, you would not see as big increases in volume, although again, it would need to be monitored in a range of ways. I think the spirit, actually, I'm going to jump to the end. The spirit of your comment about primary care and specialists is well taken. There is a new Medicare rule, the E&M rule is commonly known, that tries to change some of the weights between, I think the words you use were cognitive and procedural based care. We'll see how that plays out in Medicare and what happens. Um, with respect to, um, you call it a capitation. I'm going to go with global budgets, but I think we're pretty much talking about the same thing. It's really an operational distinction. Um, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. So um, I agree, by the way, I was not asked to talk about that. You should know I was the lead investigator evaluating the alternative quality contracted by Blue Cross and Shield of Massachusetts. And indeed, we found several things. One is the physicians shocked um, to lower price settings. Um, they reduced volume in selected areas. Quality seemed to be the same, if not better. Spending went down actually by quite a lot at the end and went down, you know, double digits by the fourth quartile. Now, some of those savings were shared. This is the beauty of shared savings models. In shared savings models, it should not be surprising that the savings get shared. I don't view that as a bad thing. If you don't share the savings, you won't have any savings to share. Um, so I am a fan of um, uh, payment reform broadly. The analogous point in this context would be how you would control the benchmark rates um, to make sure that the organizations with large market power weren't simply transferring their market power from high price and just moving it to high benchmarks. So there's some work that one has to do there. Um, I think there has been a lot of work in Massachusetts to encourage alternative payment models. I am very supportive of that in everything that I have done. Um, there are challenges because even in alternative payment models, care leaks outside of the organization that is under the uh, alternative payment model. Um, and so you have to deal with the contracting on that part. So for example, if you're atrius and you don't have hospitals, but you're in a global payment model, you still have to pay for hospital care and you have to worry about the prices there. So um, I don't know if it's an either or, my general sense is, and again, I haven't seen the Massachusetts specific data is, there is a problem with um, pricing nationally, probably in Massachusetts. I, um, to summarize, believe greater emphasis on constraining those prices, uh, which may or may not involve more legislative authority is something that I would um, advocate. But it, uh, again, if I were picking, I would try and lump that in to broader types of contracts. And again, I think now most insurers in the States will have an offer of some global uh, contract. And so you need to think about how to promote participation in them and control the rate at which the benchmarks are going up. Um, but that's a, the beauty of that question in terms of it being the last question is, it just gives you another reason to invite me back because I would love to talk about 45 minutes about how to get to more uh, and different alternative payment models in the state. Well, it's, I was just going to say, yeah, I wanted to make sure that you would come back. So I, uh, I'm letting you, but I do want to say just two things uh, as you're leaving uh, and really give credit to the people who designed uh, the uh, original legislation, section 224. First of all, I think you know this, Michael, but let me just say it to the whole group. One of the, the main uh, um, index that we use is total spending, which takes account of both prices and volume. So the comment that Chris Kreider made is absolutely correct. 
but that's why we focus on total spending or total revenue, not just prices. And second, your comment, Michael, about focusing on growth is again, very uh, apropos of what we're doing here in Massachusetts. We took a state which was not only the most expensive in terms of both prices and premiums and brought our rate of growth down to the third lowest in the country over the last several years. So our activities really do focus a lot on uh, growth rates. And in doing so, we are impacting on total spending. So again, uh, Michael, this was fantastic. Uh, you touched upon everything. I'm so glad you, you were able to join us and we will definitely have you back. Thank you so much. Thanks so much and goodbye to everybody. I look forward to hearing how the rest of the meeting goes. All right, you take care. Okay, um, all right, now I'm gonna turn the program back uh, to uh, David Sells uh, to give you a little feel for how we're gonna move forward with the remaining time and to talk more about the benchmark. David? Great, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, we're gonna shift gears now and really start to focus on the, the Massachusetts experience um, in managing uh, healthcare costs underneath the benchmark. And we'll have two presentations, one from the Center for Health Information and Analysis, uh, as well as a presentation from the Health Policy Commission, really diving deep into the data um, to try to understand where those opportunities might lie um, and, and to examine our performance. Before we do that, I do wanna just take a minute to um, briefly give an overview of the benchmark. Um, and the process uh, for modifying it, um, which is the topic that we are here today to discuss. So on the next slide here, uh, Stuart actually uh, said this perfectly. Um, in 2012, as part of our, our long journey, uh, as, as Dr. Chernew said, of, of healthcare reform in Massachusetts, the state passed a comprehensive healthcare cost, legis cost containment legislation that had as its central principle this idea of a, a healthcare cost growth benchmark that was tied to the overall rate of the state's economic growth. And so as been said before, uh, yes, continue to have growth, uh, but to restrain that growth in a way that would provide um, more affordability for businesses and uh, families and individuals that bear the high cost of healthcare in Massachusetts. As was said previously, this is done in a balance. Um, we do this uh, to try to enhance access, enhance quality, but also to get those cost savings that we need. So this is not at the expense of access or at the expense of quality. In fact, we think that we can achieve all of these goals together. And that's what we've been working towards since 2012. On the next slide, just a little bit about the benchmark itself. Um, it was uh, set at 3.6% annual growth between 2013 and 2017. Um, and then uh, beginning in 2017, the law allowed for a, a lower rate of growth to be set um, at 3.1%. And the board has elected each year to set it at that lower allowed amount of 3.1%. Of Importantly, on the right-hand side of the slide, um, what is measured is an all-in measure. So as Stuart, uh, Chair, Chair Altman said, uh, both price and quantity um, and all payers. So commercial, Medicare and Medicaid. And it also includes what people pay out of pocket. So co-pays and deductibles are included, as well as we'll hear about uh, the, the cost of private health insurance. And the goal here is really to be able to measure this, uh, all of this spending to ensure that uh, where we can always examine where um, spending may be increasing, increasing in some of these subcategories. We can, uh, this is not a cap, uh, it is a target. Uh, and as you will see, there are years where we have exceeded this target. The Health Policy Commission can, of course, uh, require that individual plans and um, providers be held accountable to the benchmark through a performance improvement plan, a process which I'll talk about briefly in a few slides. On the next slide, um, I wanted to just lay out that the Health Policy Commission's 
uh, legal authority to set the benchmark uh, was, was carefully designed in our establishing legislation. And so the law passed in 2012 actually established in law right away that the benchmark would be set uh, at the same rate of what we call potential growth state product, but is really a measure of long-term economic growth, and that the commission did not have uh, an authority to modify it beyond that point. And so that was set at 3.6% for the first five years. We're currently in this uh, second Chevron down where the Health Policy Commission has limited authority to modify the benchmark. And so the way that this works is that uh, for this time period, uh, the benchmark has a default rate of whatever that economic growth rate is minus a half a percentage point, uh, which works out to be 3.1%. And the HPC can modify that upwards uh, to up to 3.6%. So our, our ability to modify the benchmark is restrained by law, essentially to between 3.1% and 3.6%, with 3.1, the lower amount, being the default rate. Uh, beginning next year, uh, that restraint on the HPC's authority is removed, and uh, next year the HPC will have the ability to set the target uh, at any rate, subject to legislative review. On the next slide here, um, the law contemplates that in setting the benchmark, the Health Policy Commission work with the legislature in a hearing like this and solicit information from stakeholders, which we'll get later on, and to use all of the data and information collected um, in the consideration of whether the benchmark should be modified upwards from the 3.1%. If the HPC were to vote to do that, to set it at something other than 3.1, uh, that triggers then a further legislative review process, uh, including uh, working with the Joint Committee to hold a hearing, uh, and the Joint Committee can uh, issue a report and recommendations to the General Court. Um, as I've said, for the past few years where we have had this authority, that process has not been triggered because the board has elected to remain at the default rate of 3.1%, the lowest growth rate allowed by law, uh, and, and has not modified it uh, upwards. On the next slide here, um, lays out where we are in this process. So we're, we're here with a public hearing on March 25th. Uh, as Stuart said at the beginning, the board will meet again on April 14th uh, for further deliberation and a vote uh, to set the benchmark. And again, if there is a decision to modify it, that may trigger uh, further uh, activity with the Joint Committee. After the benchmark is set, um, both the Health, Health Policy Commission and CHIA monitor the performance of the system underneath that benchmark. And as shown on the next slide, uh, have the ability to identify individual health plans and providers that exceed the benchmark um, for a further review and the potential implementation of a performance improvement plan on, on the next slide. What? And then um, finally, uh, on the final slide here, would note that um, the Health Policy Commission uh, is actively working to try to influence the market to be able to meet this benchmark through a variety of different tools. Um, as, as Chair Altman said, we do not have the authority to set prices or to cap prices or regulate uh, the quantity of goods served. So the structure set forth in 224 is really one of using different levers of influence um, to help shape and guide the market to achieve the overall shared public goals that we want. And this slide just lays out some of the ways that the Health Policy Commission works to try to advance the shared goal of meeting the benchmark by issuing research and reporting, by partnering and investing in providers, by convening groups together to find solutions, and by acting as a watchdog, again, on behalf of the people and the public who bear the high cost of healthcare uh, to identify those challenges and opportunities uh, that may prevent us from being able to meet the benchmark year after year. So I'll pause there and just see if there are any questions for me about kind of the legal process for the benchmark um, before I turn it over to Ray Campbell and the Chia team 
uh, to review our performance um, against the benchmark in 2018 to 2019. Great. Well, seeing no questions, I think we can move right into the first of our two data presentations. Um, so very pleased to be able to introduce Ray Campbell, the executive director of Chia and his team. Uh, one of the great um, innovations of Chapter 224 and this effort is the partnership between the two agencies of the Health Policy Commission and Chia. And so we're very excited to turn this part of the presentation over to their team to talk about what we know about the state's performance against the benchmark in 2019. So Ray, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, David. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, Chair Altman, uh, co-chairs and members of the Healthcare Finance Committee and other uh, members of the meeting, the members of the Health Policy Commission, it's a pleasure to address you today. Um, I'll be very brief before turning it over to the members of the CHIA team. I just want to put this report in context. You've heard a lot um, uh, so far about Chapter 224 and the state measuring total health care expenditures. We're the only state in the country that actually uh, goes through this exercise of compiling all of the spending in the system, whether it's by insurers or members, whether it's by commercial insurance or Medicare or Medicaid or VA or TRICARE or uncompensated care or you know whatever, what have you. So this is a very comprehensive picture of spending in the Massachusetts healthcare economy. And in order to do that, we collect data from health plans. And there's an inherent lag in the health plans being able to identify um, their spending for a particular calendar year. So um, it's in sort of the following year that we would collect data to measure um, the, the benchmark and the other things that we measure in this annual report. Um, because of the pandemic, we actually delayed data collection in 2020 to give the health plans a little more time to process our requests. So we collected the data in the fall of 2020 rather than the spring of 2020, which is resulting in this report being released to you now rather than the typical time frame, which is in the fall. Um, I should say that while this is um, a 2019 report, Chia has many data assets, many reports. Um, many of them, if not most of them, shed light on the issues that we're going to be discussing today. And uh, many of them are current up to the end of 2020. So Chia has extensive information on the financial condition of hospitals and health systems in Massachusetts, that data is current through the end of 2020. We maintain a hospital discharge database where every single hospital discharge in the state results in a patient level record to Chia with a bunch of demographic information, diagnoses, procedures, and other information. We have that data current through the end of 2020. Um, we've been tracking enrollment trends very carefully during the pandemic because that's an important issue to monitor. We've gone from annual reporting on that down to monthly. That's current through the end of 2020. And we're just about to complete some major enhancements to our all payer claims database uh, that will take it from being an annually updated product to something that's updated quarterly, which will let us look at things much more qu quickly using that tool. So this report focuses on 2019. Um, it's a really important year because it's the sort of the baseline year, if you will, before COVID. Uh, but I want to emphasize this is not the most recent data we have. Um, so certainly as we look at trends and other issues, we can, we can look at things that are more recent as well. Um, I would like to just briefly thank uh, the people without whom this report wouldn't be possible. First and foremost, our data submitters. Um, this is not data that we just access on our own. We impose regulatory requirements on um, uh, hospitals and health plans and other participants in the system to send us data. It's difficult work. It's painstaking. Uh, we expect them to be very fussy about it, and they are. Uh, it results in very good data, but it's a difficult, heavy lift for the, the health plans and hospitals that participate with CHIA, so we appreciate their efforts. Um, I want to thank the CHIA staff. Um, this is a very complex and difficult undertaking for us. And uh, CHIA's analytic team, led by Deb Scheel, our Deputy Executive Director for Analytics and Chief uh, Analytics Officer, uh, she and her team have done a fabulous job with this. Um, I also want to thank the other agencies we've worked on in preparing this report, uh, the Health Policy Commission, the Division of Insurance, Mass Health, uh, and the um, uh, Commonwealth Connector Authority. Uh, and then lastly, I'd like to thank our actuaries at Gorman Associates who've done a really great job helping us pull all this information together. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Aaron and you can uh, start in with the report. Thanks again for having us. Thanks so much, Ray. Um, so I think we, if we can just jump right in, there's an overview slide, next slide after this, perfect. Um, so Ray touched on the first two points here um, so to round the slide out quickly before we dig into some of the key findings from this year's report, um, in terms of the publication package consistent with prior years, Chia's publication package includes a data book, 
data sets and technical documentation in addition to the report itself. Um, the report is coming in north of 100 pages and we obviously can't cover everything today. So just to highlight that in addition to the THCE, uh, TME premiums enrollment material in the report, some of which we'll touch on today, we also include a chapter on quality, which does feature some new charts um, around the patient experience surveys for the mass health population. And this year we have also expanded our reporting on payer use of funds. Um, and that's all in the report itself. So moving to the next slide. So jumping right into the key findings, um, this has been mentioned previously. So in 2019, total healthcare expenditures totaled $64.1 billion. This equates to $9,294 per Massachusetts resident and a growth rate of 4.3%. So in the next couple of slides, we're gonna dig through, um, look through these numbers. So if we can move to the next slide. So as we've, as we've mentioned earlier, to put the 4.3 growth rate in some context, we've included this year's growth as well as the final growth rate for 2017 to 2018, put it in line with the performance over the past couple of years. So we can see the current benchmark at 3.1, and we can see that the final growth for 2017 to 2018 has been revised to 3.6%. Some of the complexity behind these numbers will be addressed in the slides as we go through them. And we also discuss the nuances in the report. Um, but one note that one note to make here is that this 4.3% is based on a longer claims run out period due to the delayed data submissions of the past year. So we think this number will be more stable. Um, so if we could go to the next slide. Um, we have a lot of slides, so I'm trying to be cognizant of time. So looking at the components of total health care, so what's making up that uh, six, $64.1 billion of spending and a quick orientation to the 2019 market? we see that the net cost of private health insurance was the only component to decrease from 2018 to 2019. We'll focus more specifically on the Medicare, MassHealth, and commercial components for the rest of our slides, but we can see that both the Medicare and commercial sectors had total expenditure growth greater than 5%. This is consistent largely with prior year trends. MassHealth spending increased 2.8%, uh, which is a slight increase over the nearly flat, less than 1% spending growth that we saw last year. So moving on to the next slide. One, um, so in addition to looking at the components of THCE, we also look at the service category spending or where those dollars are being spent. Uh, so looking at the service categories, we have the four major service categories in blue, additional service categories in gray. And we saw that hospital inpatient services decelerated from prior years. From 2018 to 2019, it grew at 3.8% compared to a 5.1% growth from 17 to 18. The other three major service categories of hospital outpatient, physician services, and pharmacy all had higher growth rates. Looking at the pharmacy spending here specifically, so when we say pharmacy spending and the pharmacy spending that is displayed here represents spending for drugs that are covered under a member's pharmacy benefit. And this 7.2% growth rate is gross of prescription drug rebates that are received by payers. On the next slide, if we take those prescription drug rebates into account, pharmacy spending net of those rebates grew 3% from 2018 to 2019. Um, and this, we've included this material in our report prior, but we've broken it out into two charts um, to make it more clear, hopefully for our readers. So moving to the next slide. Great, thank you. So pivoting now, we're gonna dive deeper into the three main market segments of Medicare, MassHealth and commercial. We're gonna start with the top line numbers for Medicare, which we see here. So 19.2 billion in overall spending in 2019. As I mentioned before, it's an increase of 5.2% in that total spend. And we also see um, a slight increase in enrollment. Looking behind these numbers specifically on the next slide, 
we can break out the Medicare spending by program. So in 2019, roughly 1.2 million residents were enrolled in Medicare with just about 80% of those receiving their benefits through traditional Medicare. Uh, so this larger section of the bar. And for this population, spending increased 4.6% and enrollment increased just over 2%. Looking at the Medicare Advantage, so just under the remaining 20% of Medicare enrollees in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, we saw larger increases in both spending and enrollment within that Medicare Advantage space. Uh, we can see here that spending increased 8.4%, and we also saw enrollment increases of just over 5%. So moving to the next slide and moving into Mass Health, um, again, just some top level members. Um, we see an increase in, in overall spending of 2.8% to 15.7 billion in 2019, and we see a slight decrease overall in enrollment. Moving to the next slide and looking at mass health spending specifically by program, we continue to see shifts into the primary care ACO program. So enrollment increased in this program by 23.6%, and that enrollment shifted away from the PCC and fee-for-service programs. Um, in terms of the privately administered MCO and ACOA programs, we saw that spending was relatively flat in 2019, and there was a decrease in enrollment of just under 6%. And um, if we could move to the next slide. Thank you. So one topic that we did want to touch briefly on here, we include, um, we expand further on it and discuss APMs further in the report. Um, but we did want to touch on it briefly here. So similar to last year, the only growth in APM adoption was among Mass Health members. In 2019, just under right around 85% of Mass Health MCO and ACO members had their care paid for under an APM arrangement. Looking at the commercial and the Medicare Advantage um, sectors that are also on this graph, we continue to see either flat or decreasing adoption in the overall commercial and Medicare Advantage markets. So commercial is relatively flat and we see a slight decrease in Medicare Advantage. So moving to the next slide and focusing specifically on the commercial sector. Uh, this is the last sector that we're gonna talk about today and we're gonna spend the most time here uh, looking at very various aspects, including um, premiums and other aspects from the consumer perspective. And so, as we mentioned earlier, the commercial segment is where we saw a 5.7% increase in total spending to 24.9 billion in 2019. Overall enrollment re remained relatively flat. On the next slide, so, in the report, when we look at commercial spending in the THCE chapter, we break it out by product type. Uh, HML products continue to represent the largest portion of that commercial spending and represented just over 45% of spending in 2019 for commercial spending. Uh, we saw increases in spending and enrollment on these products. We can see here on the chart and um, that spending increased 11.6% and enrollment increased 4.8%. The other major product, the second largest one is PPO products. Uh, that had a March, a much lower spending growth of only 1.2%, um, but there was a decrease in membership of 3%. And um, so to speak further about the commercial insurance market, and we also want to highlight um, some findings from our report on elements of benefit design and impacts uh, to employers and consumers. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Ashley Storms. Thank you, Erin. Um, so we can transition to the next slide, please. Um, you've just seen a bird's eye view of healthcare spending, but we're gonna spend some more time now on the elements of the commercial insurance market that are more directly uh, relevant to members and employers of health plans. Chia collects data on three different benefit design strategies that are aimed at lowering healthcare costs. Those are high deductible health plans, tiered networks, and limited network products. 
And unfortunately, as we've already heard earlier today, over the past several years, enrollment in tiered and limited network products has largely stalled. The only strategy that's really taken off in the Commonwealth is high deductible health plans. Enrollment in these products has increased every year since we started collecting the data. And in 2019, over 35% of commercial members were enrolled in a high deductible plan. And as you can see on the slide here, there's a note that we set the threshold for a high deductible plan at $1,350 in 2019. Um, and that's the IRS minimum threshold. Um, but of course, many members had deductibles far and above that level. Next slide. So in this graph, it should, you can see the prevalence of high deductible health plans in each market sector. So essentially at the top of the slide, you have unsubsidized individuals and then employer sponsored plans going down the slide, ranked essentially by employer size. And what you'll notice is that high deductible health plans are not evenly distributed across the market. And in fact, they correlate with the group size. HDHPs are much more prevalent among unsubsidized individuals of whom 85% were enrolled in a high deductible plan in 2019. And also among employees covered by small and mid-sized group employers up to 100 employees. However, we also see that they're rising across all market sectors. In fact, the largest growth rate in 2019 was among jumbo, book, jumbo group employers with 500 or more employees. Um, so this is certainly something that is reaching every part, nearly every part of the commercial market. And it has real implications for members as well. Data from our Massachusetts Health Insurance Survey found that in 2019, among respondents who were enrolled in a high deductible health plan, 31% reported that they had had an unmet need for health care in the past year due to cost. So this is something that's affecting uh, many members in Massachusetts. Next slide. And so unsurprisingly, given those high deductible trends that I just showed you, cost sharing continued to be highest for unsubsidized individuals and members covered through smaller employer groups in 2019. Individuals and small group members experienced high cost sharing growth in 2019, similar to what we've seen in previous years. While members covered by larger employers experienced slower growth or even stable cost sharing compared to the prior year. And because most members in the market are covered by these larger employer plans, the market average trend was just 2.8% growth in 2019, which is much slower than what we saw last year where we saw about 6% growth in cost sharing. But despite this low average growth, we shouldn't overlook the fact that high deductible health plans leave members exposed to high increases in healthcare costs. Um, and that might explain these different trends we're seeing by market sector this year. Now, the next slide is going to talk about uh, premium costs. And for this, we're going to narrow our focus to the 40% of the commercial market that has fully insured coverage. So just previously, we saw a cost sharing deceleration that was only experienced by employees of larger plans. But premiums are a different story. Because in fact, in 2019, premium growth slowed in every market sector. And Besides these, these slowing everywhere, we saw something very unusual in the unsubsidized individual portion of the market, which is actually a 1.1% premium decrease on average. And that's very rarely seen. Uh, we think there were two things happening here. We were seeing enrollment shifting towards lower cost plans offered by Tufts Health Public Plans, which sells limited network products. Um, so this may be one place where limited networks are getting more of a foothold. And we also saw members enrolling in plans with lower benefit levels. And overall, the market average premium trend was 2.2% growth in 2019, compared to 5.7% growth the previous year. So again, a slowing. Next slide. So you heard just a few moments ago that commercial healthcare spending accelerated in 2019. And we've also just seen that premium growth has slowed. So these two trends impacted premium retention, which is the portion of premium dollars that go towards plan administration, taxes, and essentially anything else that's not direct medical services. Now, I'll take a minute to describe this graph because it's a bit complex. Um, but in this graph, the length of each bar represents the average premium for the year. The gray segments are healthcare claims that were paid under the health plan benefit. 
and the, the blue segments combine to, to capture this concept of premium retention that, we're, that I just discussed. And in the top cluster of bars there, those first three, that represents the merged market, individual and small group purchasers. And you can see that in 2017, 87.8% of premium funds went towards medical claims and 12.2% were retained. And then premium retention rose to 13.8% of premiums in 2018 and declined again to 11.5% of premiums in 2019. Now, the merged market is the most tightly regulated commercial market segment and margins are quite slim. So after paying taxes, broker commissions and other expenses, payers reported a surplus of just $2 per member per month or actually $20 per member per year because it was a little less than $2 in 2018. So those are the, the sorts of margins we're talking about. And in 2019, when retention declined, they reported a $6 per member per month loss in this portion of the market. Now, the next cluster of bars represents the large group market, employers with more than 50 employees. And in this portion of the market, premium retention also decreased from 13.1% of premiums in 2018 to 12.3% of premiums in 2019. However, premiums overall are higher in this part of this market and the gains were more stable. So on average, payers reported gains of $11 per member per month in 2018, and just a, a small decrease to $10 per member per month in 2019. And of course, these are averages, but different payers had a range of experiences in these market segments and they participate in different parts of the market um, for both fully insured coverage, they may also work with self-insured employer plans or public managed care programs. And then one last thing I'd say about this slide before we move on is just these percentages here on the slide are not medical loss ratios. So um, as we've already mentioned, Massachusetts has an 88% MLR threshold for the merged market. And on average across the market, this threshold was met and exceeded in every single reporting year from 2017 to 2019. And we have uh, much more detail in the report on this, including a, a new three page section that outlines some of the differences between Chia's premium retention metric and the MLR. So I would encourage you to check that out. And the next slide is going to pull together all of these trends in the commercial insurance market. So, between 2017 and 2019, cost sharing in the dark blue grew about 9% and premiums in the orange grew about 8%. And as you can see from those, those gray lines towards the bottom of the graph, uh, wages and salaries and inflation did not keep up. Um, it wasn't even close. Now, the light blue line reflects the claims that are covered by payers and by self-insured employers. And what's interesting here is that at the 2018 midpoint, where we were last year, um, the percentage increase for premiums was much higher than what we saw for claims. But by 2019, these two metrics were approximately equal. And in fact, if I took out those self-insured claims and we were just looking at fully insured claims, you'd see that uh, claim growth was slightly higher than premium growth across the two year period. And that's why we saw premium retention decrease from 2018 to 2019. And this is a normal and expected part of the underwriting cycle um, because health plan actuaries do their best to you know, anticipate future costs given all the data that they have available. But in some years, premium growth will be higher than claims and in other years, it will be lower. So to summarize, um, before we go to questions, in addition to high overall THCE growth and being above the benchmark two years in a row, we do see some concerns around affordability. And so this is an area that CHIA will continue to monitor in the future. We're currently publishing a series of affordability briefs based on survey data. Um, and it will be, of course, a topic of conversation moving forward. So thank you for your time. And we're now ready to take questions. All right, well, that was great. I mean, the amount of information that you generate is just incredible. Um, I tell people in other states, if there's one thing you need to do is to develop a CHIA because the data that Ray, you and your team put together, as you pointed out in your initial comments, 
is second to none around the country. And we could not be doing our job at all without the data you developed. So thank you again. Thank you. All right. David, uh, Celsi, you could introduce David Auerbach. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so we have one final presentation um, today before we turn to the public testimony portion of today's hearing. And so I'm going to turn it over to uh, David Auerbach from the Health Policy Commission, who will um, build off of the CHIA presentation. And what we did is we really mined the CHIA report for some of the data and tried to put it into a larger context about where Massachusetts compares to the United States, what some of these affordability challenges really mean for businesses and for families and individuals. And we're also gonna to touch at the end of this presentation just a little bit on some of the national trends about um, what happened during 2020, uh, knowing that this the COVID pandemic was such a disruptive year for healthcare spending, uh, utilization, uh, financial impacts. Um, so we'll give a little bit of a preview of, of what we know um, from some of the national data on the impact of COVID. I would note there really quickly, um, we are at simultaneously working on uh, a whole host of research and examination of the impact of COVID-19 on Massachusetts specifically. And this spring, we'll be releasing some of our initial findings on what we're calling the COVID impact study, which was required by the le healthcare legislation passed uh, at the end of the calendar year uh, and signed by the governor at the beginning of the year. Um, so much more to come uh, this spring uh, with very specific Massachusetts information, again, in partnership with CHIA that we'll be able to present. Uh, today though, we're gonna stick to some of the, the national data. So uh, with that, David, I will turn it over to you to uh, share some of our additional findings on healthcare spending. Okay, thank you, David. Um, and I do wanna thank my research team and Chia as well for releasing a, a lot of the data early to us and then answering all of our, all of our questions about what it all means. And so, um, okay, so let's go, thank you. In the first section, we will talk about spending trends through 2019, um, building off of Chia's report. So here is just another version of the, of the same slide we showed earlier with our performance relative to the benchmark, um, showing that in 2018 and 2019, we exceeded that. Um, and I'm just including at the bottom, the average spending over this full seven year period of just under 3.6% growth per year. Okay. <clears throat> Now, continuing um, what we've shown in the past, how does that compare to US spending growth in the blue? Massachusetts is in the orange in this slide and all the ones to follow. And, um, and, and again, continuation of the, of the striking trends that you see here, first of all, just how similar the patterns are of the ups and downs um, in, in Massachusetts and in the rest of the country, um, especially since around 2010. And, and again, the fact that we, that we continue to be below Although in 2018, we were basically tied. In 2019, we're uh, again a bit below that national spending growth. And then on the next slide, um, just focusing on commercial spending only, we again have been below the US average in spending growth per year um, since 2013. And that continued in 2019. Although I will say that in the Massachusetts trend, we are using just that full claims data that was um, referred to earlier by Chia. Um, that's about two thirds of the commercial market represented there. What is not represented are the ones where there might be a mental health carve out or a prescription drug carve out and Chia doesn't get the full complete data from those payers. And those trends have been a little bit higher. But you know, in terms of showing a consistent trend, we continue to be below national commercial spending growth in 2019. Okay. And um, as, as the folks from Chia did, we can break down, this is focusing on just the commercial market, which uh, most of this will do. We, can, we are then breaking down that spending, commercial spending growth by category of spend. And what we're showing in this graph is the last three years of growth um, altogether. The 2018 to 2019 growth is in the dark blue. And what stands out um, again is that in 2018 to 19, 
the largest growth driver was hospital outpatient spending at 7.6% growth. And that's growth per, per commercial member or per capita. Um, and you also saw, again, relatively high spending growth, 6.1% um, for physician care and other professionals. Um, and that's continuing a, a second year of growth. And the prescription drug spending there, the pharmacy, that is including the rebates. So that's, that's somewhat lower. And then at the bottom, we're just highlighting that taken together, the hospital inpatient and outpatient combined, that represents about 43% of total commercial spending or total commercial costs, but it accounted for 54% or more than half of the growth from 2018 to 2019. So in the next couple of slides, we're gonna delve a little farther into that. Um, first, I'm showing you just in the Medicare market, we're showing compared to the United States in the blue, Massachusetts again is the orange, 2018 to 2019 growth per person in Medicare. Again, the hospital outpatient was high in Massachusetts. Growth in spending for, for Medicare beneficiaries in that category was about twice what it was in the rest of the country. Um, and prescription drugs spending was also, also grew faster in Massachusetts than in the rest of the US. So again, that for seeing this hospital outpatient spend in both of these, we're gonna dig a little deeper into that in the next couple of slides. Um, but before I get into that, I just wanna also make one comment. So you can divide up spending by category of spending, but you can also think about prices versus utilization, going back to what uh, Dr. Chernu talked about. And though I'm not showing a slide on this, we have shown and found year after year that prices is the larger driver of growth in Massachusetts than utilization. And generally it's about, it's about twice as big. It's about 70% prices, 30% utilization. And that has been the, the overall trend uh, in the last few years. Okay, but let's go to the next slide. Okay, so what we're showing here is um, for hospital outpatient spending or, or that category of care specifically, um, we're showing price variation. And this is again, relevant to uh, Dr. Chenu's discussion. What this is showing is over the years from 2016 to 2018, how much are hospitals paid for outpatient services relative to what they to what they would have gotten from Medicare? How much more are they paid for their commercial hospital outpatient services than Medicare? And you can see all the way on the left um, that red line equivalent to Medicare. So that's a case where the hospital is paid the same in commercial as what they would have gotten in Medicare. And there's that's really the low end of the market. That's the Mercy Hospital. There's just one hospital there. And then the prices just rise as you move from left to right. And you can see um, there's a number of hospitals that are even paid more than double Medicare's payment. And overall, the price variation that you're seeing here is about three to one in terms of commercial prices relative to Medicare. So that's, that's a pretty high amount of variation. And again, that's important to keep in mind as you think about um, some of the proposals and ideas we were talking about prices. Okay. So in the next slide, um, digging into that hospital outpatient spending growth again, but now rather than prices looking at utilization, you can see from 2015 to 2019, and this is just tabulating the total number of hospital outpatient visits. Um, and this is again, data from Chia, and it shows that that volume of services has gone up from left to right um, year after year, but it's been, it's gone up differentially somewhat. You can see from 2018 to 2019, the number of visits increased 3.7%. So, so utilization in this case was somewhat of a driver of, of growth in that hospital outpatient category. Price was still more of a driver, but utilization also occurred here. But also important is that where the growth occurred. And you can see from 18 to 19 especially, there was a lot of growth in, among the AMCs. And uh, for example, for the community high public payer hospitals, hospital outpatient visits went down. And so really the majority of that 2018 to 19 growth in hospital outpatient visits occurred at the AMCs, about 71% of it. So, so you have really, you have growth in prices, you have growth in utilization, and you also have shifting from the lower, lower priced settings to the higher price settings, which also contributes to that hospital outpatient growth in spending. Okay. So now let's move to uh, talking about the affordability of care. <clears throat> Next slide, please. 
This slide is showing premiums in 2019, and we are able to again compare Massachusetts to the US. It's not exactly the same data that Chia showed on premiums, but it's, it's similar and it's related. And this is showing that our premiums dividing up by category based on the size of the employer, our premiums do continue to be higher than the US average. We have closed that gap somewhat over the last few years, but we're still persistently higher. And in this data, especially on the smaller employees employer side, our premiums are particularly above the US average. And so now in the next slide, um, I'm trying to place that those, those dollars, which are very high in the context of a family budget. And what does that really mean? That 21, $22,000 a year. So <clears throat> on the top bar, um, what I'm showing is taking an average family with average income in Massachusetts and showing how much is being spent on healthcare, including both what they're paying out of pocket in terms of deductibles and co-pays, that's that 292 on the left, and then everything that their premium is paying for, and you can divide that up as to where those premium dollars are going, um, insurance admin costs that Ashley talked about, hospital inpatient care, hospital outpatient care, and this is per month. $424 per month, $500 per month, adding up to $2,242 a month coming from that family towards healthcare. It's really a, it's, it's quite a large amount. And the point I'm making in the lower two bars is, you know, compared to the overall family budget, if you do an exercise where you subtract, you know, what a typical family has to spend on housing, transportation, food, childcare, taxes, other necessities, you can show their healthcare spend compared to what they have left at the end. And that's again, an average family with income of around $100,000 a year. And even then, if such a family say lost income during the pandemic, which almost half of Massachusetts families did, or if we're talking about not an average family, but a lower income family, you can see that they're really squeezed. And in this case, forced to either go into debt or take from other necessities. Um, to just make that budget continue to work. And so in the next slide, um, I'm gonna delve a little more into the out-of-pocket spend and the high deductibles that, that, um, that Aaron talked about. So again, borrowing some from Chia's data, um, this is from a national survey as well, but it's the same results. Deductibles have been rising in Massachusetts and we know that, and they've risen 40% since 2013. And that's the, the average deductible there for single coverage. It's over that IRS high deductible average. And particularly for small businesses, two thirds, as, as Chia showed, are in a high deductible plan. And then getting into some of the implications of this high out-of-pocket spending. And again, remember the point, nobody, nobody really wants to be in a high deductible plan. It's, you know, you have employers and families essentially forced into them as a way to control rising premium costs that they have no control over. And it's really a, you know, a last strategy, um, and in some cases, just kind of backed into it as a way to deal with these ever rising premiums. Okay, so in the next slide, this one is borrowing directly from one of Chia's recent affordability reports, and thank you for that. They asked, uh, in their survey they do every year, in 2019, um, families um, if they had issues with affordability. And those were categorized as on the right, did you have problems with family medical debt, problems paying medical bills, unmet healthcare needs, or a high share of your income paid out of pocket? And you can see in the dark blue are responses for people who were in high deductible plans. And the light blue is everybody else. More than half of those in high deductible plans had at least one of these issues. And then as you drill down, um, subset on folks with higher or lower income, subset on folks with one or more health conditions. And on the bottom, 84% of those with lower income and a health condition had one of these affordability issues. It's, it's an astounding number. And then on the next slide, we delve another level deeper on the specific question of, did you avoid necessary basic care because of cost? And here, what we're doing is taking the question of did you say you avoided needed physician care, mental health care, or prescription drugs in 2019 because of cost, you couldn't afford them? And breaking those answers down by, again, high deductible plans. And the responses for the high deductible folks, you know, on the top who had high income, still 19% had one of these avo care avoidance issues. 
Among the lower income folks, it was 29% avoided one of these types of care. And then if you divide on the very bottom by white or people of color, you find almost a third of people of color avoided basic needed care because of cost. And again, these have implications that you can imagine of care of chronic conditions being exacerbated, having to see the ED or just suffering. Okay, so now let's turn to uh, some of the 2020 data and what do we know? Again, as David said, this is gonna be all national data. We're putting together some of the Massachusetts data right now and we're not ready to share that. But as we saw in the very beginning, a lot of the trends are, are quite similar and we can kind of get a sense of what to expect. So this is the, this is the, the famous graph that we've probably seen in, in, in different contexts of what happened to care during the pandemic. And these are showing the months of 2020 and the huge April shutdown. By category of care, you can see that physician and hospital care dropped by almost 40% in April. This is spending. Um, and on the other hand, prescription drugs were not so much affected. Um, and home health care has picked up uh, back towards baseline. I'm calling the baseline here January of 2020. Um, although it's been a different story for nursing home care, which has really not recovered to pre-pandemic levels at all. And physician and hospital spending have kind of approached uh, baseline levels, but not quite gotten there. The next slide is going to just break this down into yearly, yearly totals or yearly averages by category of care. So on the left bar, you see that between 2019 and 2020, overall total healthcare spending dropped by about 1.1% here. Um, and that's after rising 6.5% between 18 and 19 national. And then you can see those blue bars again show this um, very unprecedented story um, of the pandemic. Hospital care spending was down 4% in 2020. Physician and clinical care, it was about flat home health care. Um, was up 6%, prescription drugs were up 4%, and nursing home care, again, was, was very far down from what it was in 2019. So that's total spending. And again, you know, remember that spending is a, is, a, is a combination of prices and utilization. And the stories of prices and utilization are very different during the pandemic. So the next slide will, will highlight that. Um, we'll just show you prices. So this is showing price changes over the year of 2020 relative to 2019, um, again, by sector. And you can see that the growth for hospital prices, for hospital prices in the commercial realm, particularly because all the rest of these are including Medicare and Medicaid. Um, so there in the second bar, we're highlighting commercial hospital prices. And then physician, they all jumped um, much higher than they were in the previous two years. Um, and I'm going to then highlight a month by month of that commercial hospital figure on the next slide. You can see it really a dramatic time trend that this is year over year growth in commercial hospital prices compared to the, to the year earlier. And in this series, um, it has tended to be around 2-3%. And if you went back to 2014, it would still kind of hover in the 2-3% range. And then by the end of 2020 and early 2021, it has just... Um, jumped in a way that this is data from the Alterum Institute and they, they've they just been shocked. <laughs> they've never, no one has ever seen anything like this before. So hospital prices really have spiked uh, in the last few months. Okay. And the final slide is just showing the trend in premium growth. Um, and again, this is national data, but the data that we do have for employer-based premiums showed that in 2020, they did, they did not go down. Um, tracking this this big drop in spending in the pandemic, they're pretty much pretty much a normal typical year. So people are still paying those same premiums, and it, it's unclear if they will change in 2021 either. But early signals are that they're um, you know in some markets they're going to be higher. Okay, so happy to to take any questions on any of that. All right. Uh... Are there questions? Again, if you have questions of either the CHIA discussion or the HPC discussion, if you could just put it in the chat and then Colleen will let me know. Anybody? Questions? We can start with Commissioner Cutler. Yes, please, David. Thank you for two great presentations. 
I wanted to ask about helping to understand what's going on. So Ray, I almost felt like I got too much detail relative to the, I've never before said that, I think, but relative, yeah, well, relative that's to- a, a, Economists, there is never too much detail. Yeah. So, I, 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 so the, the biggest single thing was the growth in hospital outpatient and to some extent physician services. I know in the past we've said, well, you know, some shift to outpatient care is expected and good because it's just substituting for inpatient care. Is that, so is, is like, is, is that not the case? That is what we're seeing here are things that are not substitution, but it's just kind of add on things. Or maybe we are seeing that and that's not really the issue. The issue is just even with that, the inpatient side is growing. So I'm trying to get my hands around what I should think is going on here in terms of where I wanna be looking most. Right, I think it's an excellent question. I think I, um, David Auerbach, I would ask you, know, the HPC has done some work on the question of you know, the growth in a hospital outpatient spending, how much of that is shifting from you know, lower cost versus higher cost settings. I mean, because depending on which it is, um, it's either having a positive or a negative effect on spending. And so um, I think that Chia can drill down probably, um, but I think we would probably follow the lead of the Health Policy Commission in terms of what we would be kind of looking towards. The data itself doesn't directly speak to that, but I don't know if there are trends, David, that we could follow up on kind of in the 2019 data to see if those trends are persisting in terms of those shifts that are occurring. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, it's, um, we, we did a deep dive on this in our last year's cost trends report. I think you remember. And we tried to look really hard for the exactly the kinds of things that we know are shifting and that people are telling us that are shifting. And you can identify certain, um, certain kinds of services, certain knee operations or um, hysterectomies and things like that. And we did highlight on some of those things. And I would say there is some, there is some amount of shifting. And if you just shifted a, you know, a, a surgery from an inpatient to an outpatient within the same hospital, you probably would save money. And we would say that's probably a good thing. Um, but we were showing that on net, what was happening was a lot of this a lot of what was happening was care was shifting from maybe a lower cost inpatient hospital to a higher priced outpatient hospital and you weren't saving any money. And that's, you know, it's hard to tell the overall total story of that, but that was certainly what we saw on the things that we zoomed in on in the focus. And so I would say, you know, of that spending increase on the hospital outpatient side that we highlighted, you know, some of it was volume, some of it was total volume, and probably a subset of that was coming out of inpatient, but not very much. It's mostly a it's mostly a price story and a you know lower cost to higher cost setting story as to what's behind that outpatient bump. Okay, uh, uh, Senator Friedman. Thank you. Um, this has been amazing, and I. I maybe got 2.6% of it if I'm lucky, but um, I have two questions just about the pharma piece. Um, do we, I noticed that the, the total increase was seven point something percent, but then once rebates were accounted for, it went down. What, do we know where those rebates went? Like, do we know, did they, did they show up in increase in, um, insurers revenues or PBMs revenue. I mean, they clearly aren't going to the members because you can see that by the cost that you showed increase in cost to members. But do we have any idea, do we have any way of knowing what happened with that that change, those quote, re those quote rebates? Yes, let me turn it over to the team. We don't have perfect visibility. In fact, we would love to have more visibility um, probably into the rebates. We see them more in an aggregate way, um, but we do have further information that we can share that sheds a little bit of light on some of those questions. So um, Ashley, is that the ball in your court? Sure. Um, so our understanding is that any rebate revenue that goes back to the plans is factored into um, their overall you know, finances when they're determining premium rates for the upcoming years. Um, and so currently where those show up in the THCE would be in the net cost of private healthcare. Um, they're also in the premium retention slides that I walked through earlier, those administrative expenses. 
Um, there has been a movement recently on a national level of some payers implementing point of sale rebates. Um, because of course, if you're a member with a high deductible health plan um, and you haven't met your deductible yet, what you're gonna be paying when you go to CVS or you know, whatever pharmacy you go to is that allowed amount that um, maybe doesn't you know, include those rebates. And so some payers have been moving towards incorporating those um, into the prices that a member might see at the pharmacy. Um, and you know, there's been some national reporting on this. Um, it's, very, it's fairly new in the market. And what we've seen is that um, even when payers are implementing it, it's difficult to tell in our data exactly how much of that maybe would revert to consumers because they don't implement it across the board. Maybe it only applies to fully insured plans and self-insured employers are given the choice to opt in, or maybe it only applies to certain um, plan designs. So it's, it's an issue that we've been talking to the plans about and we are definitely interested in learning more about it and understanding how it fits into our data, but there's still a lot to learn. Great, well, let us know if the legislature can help. Thank you. You know, um, you know, yes, we did provide a lot of information from both presentations, but they're very, they focus on a, on a few very important issues that we don't wanna lose sight of. One, this is 2019 now. Um, overall spending grew more than the benchmark. And there is preliminary but strong evidence that by the end of uh, 2020, price increases are beginning to grow very rapidly so that we're likely to see when we see the data um, for 2020, there's gonna be conflicting overall um, um, uh, utilization is down because of COVID, but prices are up. And the second thing that in particular, it's hospital outpatient care, which is the driving force, which is being generated both by utilization and prices. And as David Auerbach pointed out, also a shifting of the care from lower priced settings like the physician's offices to the outpatient departments of our academic medical centers. So, I mean, and I may miss a few, but if you just bear those in mind, we did talk about prescription drugs and that's an issue in and of itself, but is not the main factor generating these uh, expenditure growths. Um, so I would take other questions or comments before we turn it over. Don, do you want to say something? Yes, please. Um, sure. a, a detail, I think David Auerbach might be the best position to answer it. You showed a slide about a uh, percent of Medicare rates hospital by hospital across the com Commonwealth. Yeah. Um, can you say more about what we know about trends in, uh, in provider price variations? Overall, I mean, I, I, I don't know how closely we're looking at that now. Is this increased, decreased in any yeah. kind? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, and I know that Kate Mills and the Moat team has has worked especially on that. And my, David Saltz, correct me if I'm wrong, but my over, overall sense is that over the last several years, the price variation that we see has been pretty stable. It's, it's large, it's stable, and it's not appreciably getting worse or better. Is that right, or do we see it? Uh, yeah. Okay, so that's, 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 I believe, where we are. And so, that, David, as you pointed out, okay. even though the price variation stays the same, with an increasing proportion of the care being delivered by the high end of the system, in total, the differential in terms of spending is getting bigger. Yes, that, that, that is right. And we, in our chart pack, we've been tracking the percentage of care that's taking place at community hospitals. And we'll show you that when we're ready to show our cost range report in a month or two. And that, that continued to go down in 2019. So that does increase price variation. Other questions or comments by anyone? Um, we have Chairman Lon next. Please. Thank you. Um, David, one of, on one of the slides that showed the premium increases with the Massachusetts versus the rest of the country, 
Mm -hmm. And I think that we were leading in every category, but there was a big discrepancy in small businesses that was much larger than any other category. Yes. What are the drivers for that? It's a great question. Um, and there's, there's a couple of things that we, we, we look deeper into that same data and there's a couple of factoids that I can tell you that explain maybe some of it. Um, number one, in the rest of the country, like everywhere, smaller employers have higher deductibles. That's just true. But in the rest of the country, that gap is, is very big. It's like a $550 deductible difference from the smallest firms to the biggest. In Massachusetts, that gap is smaller. It's around $250. So our smaller employers are kind of trying to keep up with, with the bigger ones and having lower deductibles. They're still higher, but they're not as much higher. So that, that could be one of it because those premiums are not you know, generosity adjusted. There's something else that's interesting that I don't know if it's a factor, but small, small employers in Massachusetts, 43% of them offer coverage. And I'm talking under size 50. In the rest of the country, it's 30%. So more of our smaller employers are offering coverage. And maybe that's, maybe that's because some of the ones with, with you know, relatively less healthy employees are, are offering here where they wouldn't be in other states. Maybe that increases to uh, the average premium. I, I am not sure. Um, but beyond that, um, I don't really know what the reasons for, for that are. We've, but we have looked at a um, number of plans offered, for example, in the past and our smaller firms, they generally just offer one plan. They don't have the ability to shop, to look around. And you know, we've noted that our connector premiums are quite low but most aren't, um, aren't availing themselves of, of that. So that's what I can say. All right, all right. any other? Um, I'm gonna turn the program now over to uh, short presentations by outside people. And I'm gonna ask uh, our, our really uh, impresario of all this stuff, Colleen Ostermark, for her to sort of uh, introduce our outside uh, comments. Colleen? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Stuart. I'm just letting in our first testifier and then I will go through some, some ground rules here. Thanks everyone for bearing with us. So now we're moving to the live uh, public testimony portion of the hearing. Uh, as indicated in the notice of hearing, advanced sign up was required for live testimony today due to the remote nature of the hearing. So we actually have nine people signed up to testify today and they're all in the waiting room. Thank you all for being so diligent. There is still an opportunity to provide testimony after what you've heard today. So members of the public, we invite you to submit written testimony. We'll post it to the HPC's website. We're at mass.gov slash HPC. The deadline for submitting written testimony is tomorrow, Friday, March 26th at 5 p.m. So please note that deadline. As I said, everyone who's testifying uh, will be head in, held in the waiting room until it's their turn. I'll let you know um, who is up and who is on deck. And just as a reminder of the rules of the road, and we're running about 20 minutes late, so I will ask you to keep to this. We ask that oral testimony be limited to five minutes per speaker per, per organization. So if there are any questions, as always, from commissioners or members, just please let me know, raise your hand, or, or send me a chat message or a text message, and I will, I will call on you. So feel free to ask these folks questions. Um, all that being said, we are going to start today with um, Liz Leahy from the Mass Association of Health Plans. Liz, it looks like you are in the room and ready to go. Thanks, Colleen. Good afternoon. Thank you, commissioners, members of the Healthcare Financing Committee. My name is Liz Leahy. I'm the Chief of Staff and Vice President of Advocacy and Engagement at the Massachusetts Association of Health Plans. We represent 16 member health plans and two behavioral health organizations that provide coverage to approximately 3 million Massachusetts residents in the commercial market on the state's health connector in Mass Health and for duly eligible individuals. And we appreciate the opportunity to provide comments today. Um, I'll cut to the chase. We support maintaining the benchmark at 3.1% for 2022. But given the findings shared today by Chia and the Health Policy Commission and Professor Chernu, we wanted to highlight some of the persistent challenges that threaten our ability to meet the benchmark, as well as some new challenges that were born from the pandemic. 
Um, I'll start with uh, the impact of COVID-19. So as we've seen, healthcare spending in 2020 and now in 2021 was impacted by a number of changes to utilization and to coverage. The pandemic caused early disruptions in both elective and necessary care, followed by a rebounding beginning in the summer months. Uh, growth in telehealth, particularly in the behavioral health space, has certainly contributed to that rebounding, but we remain concerned about the impact of deferred care and continued COVID infections on healthcare spending. The health plans in Massachusetts have also shouldered a number of new coverage requirements resulting from the pandemic, including coverage of testing and treatment without cost sharing, significantly expanded coverage of telehealth services with payment at the same rate as an in-person visit, um, and coverage of provider fees for administration of the COVID-19 vaccine. While we're hopeful that 2022 will represent a return to more typical utilization and spending, the impact of new mandates and increased costs borne by the health plans, as well as deferred care will certainly affect the healthcare spending in the state and the health plan's ability to meet the cost growth benchmark. Turning to today's findings, healthcare costs in Massachusetts remain among the highest in the nation. They continue to grow at an accelerated rate across all service categories, posing a significant challenge for individuals, for families, for employers. Now more than ever, the cost growth benchmark is a vital guardrail for monitoring performance in the healthcare sector, for setting priorities for addressing costs, and for holding the entire system accountable because the very same factors continue to challenge the cost benchmark. Persistent increases in prices, care being delivered at and shifting to high cost settings and continued increases in prescription drug costs with little transparency for drug manufacturers. Not only do these factors challenge our collective ability to meet the state's benchmark, regardless of where it's set, they also contribute significantly to increasing premium costs for individuals, families and employers. Over the past decade, more than 30 state reports have examined healthcare costs and key cost drivers, and each and every report has found that the prices charged remain the most significant factor in driving healthcare costs. Chia's annual report this year tells the same story. We saw significant increases in hospital outpatient spending, while hospital inpatient spending also increased. We saw growth in spending for physician and other professional services from 2018 to 2019 as well. And as um, folks were just speaking about a moment ago, while we may be seeing volume shift from hospital inpatient to hospital outpatient care, there's been little cost savings realized because of a shift to higher cost outpatient centers, with the highest price hospital systems garnering payments between 40 and 78% above the median. These trends are especially concerning as high priced hospital systems continue <coughs> to expand, building outpatient, urgent care, ancillary facilities to serve patients directly in the community. Despite these trends, accountability for hospital systems is limited. So for example, the scope of the PIP process applies only to health plans and primary care provider groups. We recommend that the HPC consider the importance of full system accountability to the PIP process. Another persistent cost driver is prescription drug spending. Gross pharmacy spending increased by 7.2%, 3% net of rebates, which are returned to employers and consumers through decelerating premium increases. And prescription drug spending accounts for nearly a quarter of commercial spending. Um, concerningly, this does not include hospital administered drugs like chemotherapy and other oncology medications, which have seen significant increases as well. And at the height of the pandemic, we saw increases on 67 brand name drugs in July of 2020 alone. For the past several years, while providers and payers have been accountable to the benchmark, pharmaceutical manufacturers have notably been missing. And this lack of representation has allowed years of unchecked cost growth for prescription drug manufacturers. That's why we support um, the HPC's recommendations to increase oversight transparency for the full drug distribution chain, to expand the HPC's current authority to review drugs with a financial impact on the commercial market, and require drug manufacturers and PBMs to participate in the annual cost trends hearing. To wrap up, I'd like to share a little bit about an exercise that we're engaged in at MAP that I think echoes some of the comments and questions raised by commissioners earlier. I'm happy to share it with folks once it's complete. So every few years, we look at all of the reports issued by the Health Policy Commission, by CHIA, the Attorney General, and compile a report synthesizing the key cost drivers and other notable trends. And while we weren't able to refresh that report this year because of the pause on reporting in 2020, we've done something a little bit different. So we've looked at all of the key cost drivers and trends and then reviewed all of the legislation and regulations passed since 2010 to see what's been done to address those cost drivers. 
What we found was concerning. Despite the recommendations made by the HPC and others, much of the legislative and regulatory actions have actually not sought to address the underlying cost drivers and have instead sought to remove important tools used by the health plans to rein in spending. Um, through this study, it's become really clear how important the work of the Health Policy Commission and CHIA are and how important it is that we redouble our efforts to adopt policy solutions to address those underlying cost drivers. Premiums, member cost sharing, consumer trends, these all reflect the cost of care. Now more than ever, it's essential that we address these underlying cost drivers in order to provide relief to consumers and employers. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Any questions for Liz Leahy? Okay, great. Thanks so much, Liz. Thank you. Next, I would like to introduce Deb Wilson, who's the president and CEO of Lawrence General Hospital. And one to let you know that Alex Sheff from Healthcare for All is on deck. Thank you. Well, thank you, David and the Health Policy Commission Board. And thank you to the House and Senate Healthcare Chairs. We really appreciate all the work that you do. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Deb Wilson. I'm the President and CEO of Lawrence General Hospital, a hospital experiencing significant shortfalls from inadequate reimbursement and from the dramatic negative impact of COVID-19. In the past 12 months, our hospital has met the outsized demand for COVID hospital care in the city of Lawrence. This community has the highest per capita rate of COVID-19 in the Commonwealth. One in four Lawrence residents in our city of more than 80,000 has had COVID. The city's mortality rate is among the highest, reflecting the findings of epidemiologists who found that color, poverty, and crowding cause, causes substantially higher COVID mortality. While we understand the importance of the cost growth benchmark, there is no sustainable plan forward for our hospital without a higher growth rate and the cost growth benchmark that you will establish. I would respectfully ask that you ask yourself an additional question today. Please put a healthcare lens on the question, how should you look at the cost growth benchmark with a health equity lens? Lawrence General has among the highest proportion of mass health patients. We are paid 74% of our cost for those patients from MassHealth. And additionally, the CHIA data says that we are paid 77% of the average for commercial patients. And we serve a city that has the highest concentration of people of color. 88% of Lawrence residents are of color. We can't escape the years of low rates and the impact that that has had on our hospital that is due to a multitude of factors, including the cost growth benchmark. That we are a critically important hospital for this community and the Merrimack Valley is indisputable, but our sustainability and our ability to continue to provide key services is on the line. So what does having fewer resources mean for health care delivery for the community we serve? Just let me share a few quick examples. We hired obstetrical hospitalists to have an obstetrician in our hospital 24 seven to improve maternal child health outcomes for a very complex population. If we cannot afford to fund this level of care, the sad reality is that mothers and babies and families will suffer the consequences. We hired behavioral health nurse practitioners for our emergency room, one of the busiest emergency rooms in the state and, and for our inpatient units. But if we cannot afford to provide that level of care, the sad reality is that these behavioral health patients will suffer. There is no sustainable plan to support a hospital with Medicaid shortfalls and with this cost growth benchmark. And I do believe the Health Policy Commission cares about health equity and cares about ensuring that access to health care to this community is preserved. So please look at your cost growth benchmark decision with a health equity lens. By not applying that lens, you will perpetuate the weakness of hospitals like Lawrence General that are paid the least. 
I know that you care about this issue. So 2020 tested our hospital's resilience and it showcased our capacity. Some weeks it wasn't unusual to have more than 75% of our inpatient capacity dedicated to recovering COVID patients. We met this need by expanding ICU capacity like many other hospitals. We staffed up and we stood up for this community. We created a, an eight lane testing site in partnership with the city and the state and now we are vaccinating more than 1,000 people a day in Lawrence in partnership with the city and the state. We are still a recovering community and we don't know when healthcare delivery will return to normal. But I would ask you to consider putting a lens on your decision today to ensure that Lawrence General and providers like Lawrence General will be able to provide key services. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Deb. Any questions for Deb Wilson? Okay, great, thank you so much. Next up, we have Alex Sheff, who's the co-director of policy and government relations for Healthcare for All. Welcome, Alex. And on deck, we have Kim Holland from Signature Healthcare Brockton. Putting a lens on your decision. Alex, unmute yourself. Uh, Deb, any questions for Deb Wilson? Okay, great, thank you so much. Next up, we have Alex Sheff, who's the co-director of policy and government relations for Healthcare for All. Welcome, Alex. And on deck, we have Kim Holland from Signature Healthcare Brockton. Great. Putting a lens on your uh, great, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Alex Sheff. Um, I'm co-director of policy and government relations at Healthcare for All, and thank you for the opportunity. Alex, unmute yourself. Uh, Deb, any questions for Deb Wilson? Hey, okay, great. Thank you. So Sorry about that, Alex. Why don't you start over again? No problem at all. Can everybody hear me now? Wonderful. Apologies. Uh, so um, uh, my name is Alex Sheff. I am the co-director of policy and government relations at Healthcare for All. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, we advocate for health justice in Massachusetts by working to promote health equity and ensure coverage and access for all. Uh, HICFA believes that given the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, making healthcare more affordable and accessible is as important as it has ever been. And this requires continuing to use the cost growth benchmark to keep system costs down and considering additional policy changes. An increase uh, to the cost growth benchmark would come at a cost to individuals and families who simply cannot afford it. Uh, the weight of the pandemic cannot be placed on the shoulders of consumers. We recognize drops in utilization due to the COVID-19 surge last spring may lead some uh, to push for higher reimbursement rates to compensate for losses and that others may argue that rebounding utilization requires higher premiums. However, HICFA believes neither are warranted given the data we have so far. GIA analysis shows that while hospitals sustained losses and negative margins in April and May, COVID relief funds resulted in uh, large positive margins in June and July. The funds appear to have done exactly what they were intended to do, stabilizing hospital margins so that future rate increases. Therefore, the benchmark should not need to adjust for this. The CHIA analysis also showed that while utilization in Massachusetts, including ED visits and inpatient admissions rebounded to a steady state in July, uh, they remained 20 and 10% below 2019 averages. This suggests that utilization is not rebounding above previous average levels in a manner that requires premium increases or adjustments to the benchmark. So we therefore recommend that the Health Policy Commission continue to set the 2022 benchmark at its lowest possible level of 3.1%. We also strongly urge HPC to identify ways to ensure consumer costs do not exceed the benchmark. While the state has seen some success in keeping overall healthcare spending under the cost benchmark, um, in the CHIA data available prior to today, healthcare consumers have seen out-of-pocket costs and premiums grow twice as fast as overall uh, costs, straining family budgets and putting care out of reach for many. COVID-19 pandemic has only heightened consumers' need for relief from these costs. Access uh, to care for chronic conditions has been especially important for those at high risk for more severe COVID complications. 
At the same time, uh, residents have faced dire financial predicaments uh, as they lost jobs and saw their hours cut, a financial hole that will take uh, many families years to climb out of. We hear affordability concerns daily on our helpline uh, that takes 20,000 calls a year. One caller, Anne, called because even though she has coverage through the connector with a household income of $50,000 a year, she couldn't afford the co-pays for her prescriptions. Another woman whose husband is disabled called because her income was not enough to continue paying $567 a month in premiums for her plan uh, through the connector. She ended up having to cancel her insurance because it wasn't affordable. And data confirms uh, the challenges that we hear daily from callers. The CHIA's health insurance survey found that in 2019, over 25% of residents went without needed medical or dental care due to costs. One third went without care because of high copays, and nearly one in four went without care because of their deductible, which we've heard a lot about today. The high cost of care is preventing even consumers with insurance from accessing necessary treatments and services. Uh, the pandemic has shown the deadly consequences of going without treatment for chronic conditions. The CHIA 2019 annual report, again, the most recent available uh, previously, shed light on why member cost sharing and premium increases were far outpacing not only overall healthcare cost growth, but importantly, wage and salary growth. Consumers are paying more of every dollar they earn towards healthcare and shouldering more than their share of the burden. And healthcare affordability is also fundamentally an issue of health equity. More Black and Latinx residents in Massachusetts report problems paying medical bills than white families. Black and Latinx families had lower rates of physician visits and were less likely to report taking medications. However, many chronic conditions that require extensive medical treatment, such as asthma and diabetes, disproportionately impact communities of color. These disparities combined had a deadly effect in the pandemic. Black and Latinx residents were more likely to contract, be hospitalized for, and die from COVID-19 in Massachusetts. It was the direct result of decades of policies that perpetuated structural racism and years of financial barriers to accessing necessary care. It's not surprising then that Massachusetts residents identified lowering healthcare costs as their number one priority for state policymakers in a Mass Inc. poll from January, followed only by making healthcare accessible as the number two priority. Although consumer costs outpace the overall system cost, they are nonetheless a response to underlying cost drivers. Hospital costs are the single largest driver of cost growth, accounting for more than 40% of, of growth in the last uh, CHIA report, with price variation, as we've seen, resulting in some contributing much more than others. Uh, prescription drug costs were also a significant cost driver, accounting for 14% of growth. So in addition to recommending that the benchmark be set at 3.1%, we would like to briefly highlight other legislative recommendations that we support to address consumer costs underlying the drivers of costs. Alex, I'm so sorry, you have hit time if you could just wrap it up for us. Thank you so much. Sure, no problem. So I'll just mention um, the More Affordable Care Act that sets a consumer specific benchmark um, that also establishes a reinsurance program to bring down uh, premiums for individuals and small businesses, uh, enhance DOI's rate review, and implement uh, value-based insurance design that would institute no cost sharing um, for certain uh, chronic conditions, um, for treatments for certain chronic conditions, as well as a high cost uh, hospital transparency act that would uh, require CHIA to annually report on hospital contribution to total medical expense. Um, getting at those hospital costs. Uh, finally, we were su support prescription drug uh, affordability bills as well uh, that would build on the uh, successful mass health process with an HPC review process to address high price drugs. Thank you very much for your time today. Thanks so much, Alex. And just a PSA to the folks in the waiting room, when you come into our Zoom, make sure you have the YouTube live stream off or on mute because it, it will play on delay when you come off, off of mute here. So that being said, we'd like to welcome Kim Holland, who's the president and CEO of Signature Healthcare Brockton, and on deck is John Hurst from RAM. Kim, you're up, thank you. Well, good afternoon, Chair Altman, Chair Friedman, Chair Lawn, and members of the legislature and HPC board. I'm Kim Holland, president and CEO of Signature Healthcare, a 260-bed hospital and multi-specialty and primary care physician group serving the city of Brockton and surrounding towns. We've been doing our part to help Massachusetts meet the benchmark. We were an early adopter of value-based contracting and taking risk. We participated in every payer's risk contracting opportunities. 
We've also designed health insurance products for our own employees that have had an annual negative cost trend for a five-year decline of a negative 6.2%, proving that thoughtful plan design and health care delivered by providers who totally manage care can drive down cost, despite the reality that we are a much lower paid as a hospital than all of the surrounding hospitals in our area. We were largely successful with risk. We kept care in our system from leaking to higher cost hospitals. We embraced risk contracting, achieving savings by changing how we delivered care. That's the upside, but there's a downside. That was talked about earlier in the first half of the, of the uh, discussion today. The cost growth benchmark as a policy is blunt. Over time, it's reduced the resources available to take care of the health in, a, in my community and ensures that my hospital falls farther behind each year. If a person making $200,000 a year gets a 3.6% raise and a person making $20,000 a year gets a 3.6% raise, the income gap of $180,000 grows by $6,500 per year. And that difference is compounded year after year as the wealthy reinvest for additional income. The benchmark is uniformly applied, as you know, even if you're paid at the bottom. And it's aggressively applied by commercial and mass health alike. It assumes we've all been actors ratcheting up cost, contributing to cost growth. And that's just not the reality. If you examine how the policy applies in reality, it's like a regressive tax. I think the HPC and legislature have a sense of this, but have not found a method to recognize it. I may not have been in Massachusetts long enough to lose my Alabama accent, but I know that Massachusetts is not in favor of a regressive tax. The benchmark is an overlay on top of a system that starts with extreme variation in resources. Earlier this month, Chia sent me Brockton Hospital's 2019 commercial statewide relative price. It's 82.6% and we represent only 67 one hundredths of the commercial hospital spend. That's two thirds of 1% of the overall commercial hospital spending is at Brockton. That's not a lot. The same is true of other hospitals in city like Brockton. We don't get paid very well and we take care of some of the most impoverished pop populations the majority of which have a social vulnerability index highlights that are extreme. The benchmark you're here to set today is working to reduce cost growth. However, we should also develop approaches that improve equity and further reduce cost. And we should counter the unintended consequences of our current efforts that lock in place existing disparity. Proportionally, Brockton Hospital and its peers in other cities who are paid the lowest effectively have fewer resources for our local hospital systems to care for a population that has more challenging health conditions to manage. For our patients to have equal outcomes, we must provide additional support, helping them overcome barriers. I ask you to recognize the consequences of setting a statewide benchmark that is designed to harness cost growth when applied to cities like Brockton, providing another tool to perpetuate an unequal distribution of resources to certain populations and their providers. Thanks for what you're doing. Uh, thanks for listening. And I wish you well as you set a very difficult policy for the state. Thank you so much, Kim. We appreciate it. Okay, welcoming in uh, John Hurst from the Retailers Association of Massachusetts. And on deck is Susan Fendo. John, whenever you're ready. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Mr. Chairman, commissioners, David and staff. Uh, my name is John Hurst. I'm president of the Retailers Association of Massachusetts. I appreciate your indulgence of hearing from me each and every year at this hearing. And, and I do that because it's a very important hearing. And every year I report upon uh, the results of our members uh, survey. Every year we, uh, we uh, survey our members for uh, what are they seeing um, in their in their premiums, because this is the time of year, quite frankly, when they they um, uh, get their renewals. The biggest small business renewal is, in Massachusetts is April one, and we know that the average that from the DOI reported was seven percent. And I, let me just uh, share my screen if I could. Um, there it is. 
Uh, this is our the results of our survey. I'll just go this through this really quickly. Um, uh, basically, this shows we've been we've been uh, surveying our members since the passage of Chapter 58, and the blue line at the top shows uh, where our members are. Um, that blue line, and below you'll see a just for a measurement standpoint, we we take a look at the GIC because that is a large purchasing group of consumers and it's publicly available. We also add in the inflation rate, which is the purple line on the bottom. And since 2013, we've been putting in the HPC benchmark. Uh, as you will see for 2021, our, our return was 7.64. Now, if you do a average over the nine years since we set the benchmark, the average over nine years is 9%. Now, that's three times, roughly three times the benchmark. It's three times the inflation rate. Um, it's far in excess of the GIC. And I now I'm no mathematician or I don't even know much about all, all the risk pools out there, but if, if small businesses are seeing increases that are two and three times above the benchmark, somebody else is at the benchmark or well below it. And that, you know, if, if, if this was an anomaly, if this happened, Mr. Chairman, you know, one year out of five, it would be one thing, but it happens each and every year. And our members report that they almost all are at high deductible plans, number one, but also they're paying more for less coverage. Things that used to be dollar one coverage like lab tests, they're having to pay out of pocket. They're simply paying much more for less coverage today. And we want to know why. Um, you know, we have a situation in Massachusetts where we're the, we're, we passed chapter 58. Uh, we merged our non-group and small group together. That's something that the ACA did not copy. And it's something that the other states did not copy as well. And, and with the passage of ACA, we lost rating factors, which were meant to uh, appropriately apportion costs within the merge marketplace to make sure small businesses and their employees were not injured. And as as we know, those have been phasing out and that's part of the problem for small businesses as well. There's a real equity question here. Are small businesses frankly paying a lot more so someone else can pay a lot less? Perhaps within the merge marketplace, perhaps outside of the merge marketplace. Who is it that's at or below the, the, uh, uh, the, the benchmark? Uh, we need to have delve into that a little bit more. We need more transparency on that. We clearly need to, to freeze um, uh, not allow the, the uh, uh, benchmark to go up, but we, we need to look at ways to maybe lower it and reform it. Maybe in the future, we don't want to include public payers in the, the benchmark. Is that skewing the, the figures for those that are frankly hurt the most? Those are small businesses and, and, and their employees. Those are actually paying the premiums. We've got to look at ways because I, I fail to believe that small businesses and their employees are two or three times less sick, or more sick, I'm sorry, than public employees and, and those that work for big businesses. I, I fail to believe that employees of small businesses are two or three times uh, worse consumers of those elsewhere in, in the marketplace. We've got we've to come to grips with this. The governor did a year ago create a, the Merge Market Advisory Council, which got delayed a bit because of COVID, but we hope to see a, a result of a report on that this spring. The combination of freezing this benchmark, looking at ways to maybe improve it in the future, and looking at ways that we can fix the, the equity problem for small businesses should be on the, on the top priority list for all of us, whether it's the HPC, CHIA, or DOI. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, John. Any questions for John Hurst? All right, great. Thank you, John. Take care. Next, we have um, Susan Findell, who's the Legislative Director for the Mental Health Legal Advisors Committee, and then on deck is Lauren O'Martian. Uh, thank you. I'm sorry. I need to mute uh, the public hearing. Uh, thank you. Uh, last year, uh, the, the um, Mental Health Legal Advisors Committee, which is an agency under the Supreme Judicial Court, um, submitted testimony along with uh, health law advocates and the Massachusetts Association for Mental Health 
about an issue that not only disables and kills people, but increases uh, healthcare costs. That is diagnostic overshadowing, attributing physical health care symptoms to mental health issues, and implicit bias against people with psychiatric uh, diagnoses. Despite extensive uh, peer review research, healthcare policymakers have largely ignored uh, this issue. People with mental illness <clears throat> are not imagining inferior health care. Providers in a recent study admitted that they have negative reactions to people with mental illness and that that reaction uh, affects clinical decision-making and poses a risk uh, to the safety of patients. The bottom line, uh, mental uh, illness uh, and discrimination based on mental illness uh, results in inferior care, and not just for people with serious mental illness, but also uh, for, for people who just have any uh, psychiatric diagno uh, diagnosis in their medical record. There are many myths about why people uh, with mental illness die 15 to 30 years earlier than others. It is not about access to mental health care. 60% of people with mental illness die because of preventable and treatable conditions. It is not about access to physical health care providers. People with mental illness have more interactions with doctors than other people, probably because they're coming back again and again. So somebody will take their physical health care seriously. Um, and it is not about lifestyle choices according to studies. The same condition in a person with a, a mental health uh, diagnosis uh, receives poorer care and has poorer outcomes. Promoting integration of care where mental health care becomes a prominent part of the overall health care of a person is irresponsible without monitoring the physical health care of uh, people with psychiatric diagnoses. Financial incentives, please abandon in incentives that uh, encourage providers to cut care. Designating services as unnecessary and low value undermines uh, person-centered care. And shifting costs to patients, is, even through tiering, is counterproductive. Uh, lower costs can be achieved uh, by pursuing something other than the traditional medical model. Fun peer respites, not, not more psychiatric uh, hospital beds. Uh, have clinics offering peer support that are open on weekends and evenings. Have insurance cover alternative modalities of mental health care, meditation, exercise groups, emotional support animals, uh, art therapy. You will find more success when people can choose their path to recovery. They cost less. There's less risk to them than traditional uh, mental health care treatment, such as medication, which has the potential to raise costs uh, due to uh, side effects like weight gain and organ damage. Galvanize true change in how the healthcare system addresses social determinants. Have insurers and ACOs fund housing rather than refer people to underfunded government programs that can't meet demand. All of these issues are fundamental to healthcare equity. Psych discrimination compounds race discrimination. Blacks are three times as likely to be misdiagnosed with schizophrenia and then receive more antipsychotics at higher doses and, and be hospitalized more often. Alternatives uh, more closely match the preferences of uh, Black people, according to uh, uh, Susan. I'm so sorry. We are we are over time. If you could just wrap up for us, thank you. Okay. So last thing: social determinants must be addressed because a normal reaction to poverty should not be characterized as a mental illness. Thank you very much. Look forward to working with you. Thank you so much, Lauren. Oh, sure.
Okay, great. Now we're just letting in Christopher Carlozzi, um, who's the state director from for the National Federation of Independent Business. Welcome, Chris. Hi, Colleen. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Freeman, Chair Lawn, members of the Committee on Healthcare Financing, Chair Altman, and members of the Commission. Uh, thank you. My name is Christopher Carlozzi, and I'm the state director uh, for the National Federation of Independent Business. Uh, we represent over 5,000 small businesses across the Commonwealth. Our members are involved in all types of industry, uh, including manufacturing, retail, wholesale, service, and agriculture. The average NFIB member uh, has about five employees. And in short, NFIB re represents the small Main Street business owners from across our state. Uh, these are also the types of businesses that were severely impacted by the pandemic, uh, with many having to reduce their employees and are only just beginning to bring workers back into the workforce. As businesses are allowed to gradually reopen, and as restrictions begin to loosen, small businesses are eagerly resuming their operations. Every four years, NFIB releases uh, a small business problems and priorities report. Prior to the pandemic in 2020, health costs remained the number one issue for small businesses and has been in that number one spot for 29 years. According to NFIB's national data, health insurance costs for small firms have risen 43% in the last decade. Uh, the price tag of healthcare in the Commonwealth is a significant cost of doing business and a significant consideration when creating a new job. And unfortunately, health insurance expenses continue to increase annually for small businesses as premiums are expected to rise on average about 7% as we heard earlier. It's more important than ever that Massachusetts finally address cost and the cost of care for small businesses who have been greatly impacted by this pandemic. As you all know, Massachusetts was hit particularly hard by the COVID crisis resulting in record high unemployment. Many small businesses were forced to close their doors or operate under strict capacity limits. Uh, businesses sought state and federal loans to simply stay afloat. And according to NFIB's research center, most uh, it, we do a COVID-19 in business survey. And in the most recent one, Sales levels are at 50% or less than they were uh, at this point in 2020 for 22% of small businesses, with another 21% reporting uh, sales levels at 51 to 75% of pre-crisis levels. There is still 13% of surveyed small businesses that fear their doors may close permanently if conditions do not improve. The econo uh, economic outlook for small employers is just beginning to improve, though, with 11% of business owners reporting conditions are back to normal, up from 5% in January. So in short, small businesses are still struggling with fewer customers, a decrease in revenue, all while attempting, attempting to operate under restrictions. And add these new pandemic related costs like PPE, increased sanitization, plexiglass, air purifiers, all on top of rising labor costs. Massachusetts has proved year after year, we have addressed health coverage and quality of care, but we have still yet to address cost and more specifically costs for small businesses who face annual premium increases. Meaningful reforms are often stripped from legislation, and bills do end up progressing. Uh, uh, what that do end up progressing result in higher costs. Any legislative healthcare-related policy we feel in 2021 must include more equity for small businesses through choice and increased competition within the market. We'd certainly like to see uh, the cost growth benchmark stay where it is or end up lower and also dig into it a little deeper on a more granular level to see why small employers are still facing these increases. Uh, I won't reiterate what was said earlier, but we do need to take a harder look at that and see why small employers are paying more. Because I almost feel like it's Groundhog Day. More These comments today are very similar to the comments that I made in 2018 and 19 in the cost trends hearing, but some things are worth repeating. And health costs continue to rise for small businesses. Often we hear that Massachusetts stayed within the spending benchmark, while many of my members experience rising premiums each year. Costs are being contained for some, but not small employers. I am eager to read the findings of the Merged Market Advisory Board that was created in 2019, and hopefully we'll finally discover why small employers continue to pay more for the cost of health insurance, while others are not. For the sake of the economic well-being of, of Main Street businesses in an extremely fragile state, I hope we find ways to finally address costs and deliver the promise of lower price coverage for small businesses and their workers. I truly hope to come back next year and say that costs were lowered for small businesses and that we finally address that. 
So I thank you for the time today and I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks so much, Chris. Okay, last but not least on our testimony list, we have Thomas Brown. Tom, if you could put your video on for us. Sorry about that. I don't Welcome. know why my video on. Um, thanks so much for hearing my testimony. Uh, I am uh, a certified peer specialist. And for people who don't know what that is, it's uh, a person who is trained to use their lived experience of mental health challenges in the service of helping other people uh, with other uh, types of psychological distress. I'm also uh, a clinician. Uh, and then I'm also an educator. So I educate uh, organizations, uh, especially community mental health organizations on how to uh, perform trauma informed and recovery oriented uh, service models. Uh, I, for, before I go into my main point, I want to speak to Susan Findell's uh, point about discrimination in healthcare. I have experienced this countless times. It is very real and it's really very terrifying. So I just want to reinforce uh, what she um, spoke about. It couldn't be more true. Um, but the main thing I want to speak about is an alternative to psychiatric uh, hospitalizations, um, which are extraordinarily expensive. Um, there is uh, what we call, uh, several people have spoken to this, peer respites. And so these are um, an alternative to psychiatric, expensive psychiatric hospitalizations. And they're run by people like me, certified peer specialists, um, and they're completely run by, by peer specialists. So we don't have, you know, a, a heavy uh, psychiatric nursing presence. There's a, a psychiatrist on call um, if needed. And uh, these are, there's actually only one in the state right now, and it's run by the Wildflower, uh, Wildflower uh, Alliance in Western Mass, formerly the Western Mass Recovery Learning Community. Um, and so, if we look at the bottom line between psychiatric hospitalizations and uh, peer respite uh, hospitalizations, uh, there's an enormous savings. So there was a, a, a paper or a report uh, published in 2019 uh, by the uh, University of Southern California Schaefer Center for Health uh, Policy and Economics. And they found that a peer respite, uh, about a, a week's stay in a peer respite costs um, under $3,000. And compare that to a psychiatric hospitalization that can run anywhere from $5,000 to $16,000 in uh, the state of Massachusetts. That's an enormous saving. Uh, the other thing, there was a, a paper uh, that was published in 2018 by Bouchery et al. Um, and they found that there was an average uh, 2,138 savings um, in, in peer respites over psychiatric hospitalizations. So I wanna speak a little bit about the, another thing that's very compelling about peer respites as opposed to psychiatric uh, hospitalizations. Uh, so I, I, I trained, uh, uh, clinical uh, community models of uh, psychiatric help. And I'm always interested in what users' experiences are. So I'm always interviewing people about how their experience was in a psych unit on a, a peer respite and then compare, compare the two. Um, almost always when I talk to someone who's been in a peer, spare, uh, peer uh, respite, their response is so pleasant and uh, the, the look on their face is actually, you can, you can read their experience on the look in their face. And I ask people about their psychiatric stays. I see a lot of tension. I see the eyebrows are knit. And often these are very troubling stays. I did a clinical um, internship on a... Uh, crisis stabilization unit at psychiatric uh, crisis stabilization unit here in Boston for two years. What I saw really frequently was an aggressive approach to people who were using the services. Um, not everybody, there were wonderful staff there too, but way too often there was this judgment of people using the service like they had done something wrong 
um, or that there was something that they bad about them for, for being on the unit. Um, so you could see that discrimination at work there and the result on people, the effect on people could be horrendous. You might have somebody come into the crisis stabilization unit who had just survived a rape and then somebody humiliates them, the staff humiliates them or it's rough with them or cuts them off or changes their medication without their consent. Uh, and it can have an incredibly traumatic effect on people for somebody who's survived that kind of violence recently and they're already incredibly vulnerable. It has a profound traumatic effect. At the peer run respite, you just don't get that. People understand why people are there. Behaviors are not misinterpreted as bad behavior. The person is not seen as a bad person or a failure for being in there because the peer themselves understands what the person is going through and what they have been through. So there's this mutual empathy that they're met with. Uh, and so the outcomes are just so much better. And there also is a lower um, reliance on medication uh, through peer respites. So that's all I have. Thank you so much for hearing me today. Thank you so much, Tom, we appreciate it. Okay, that brings us to the conclusion of our live testimony. I would like to turn it back to the chairman for some final remarks. All right, well, listen, this was a phenomenal um, set of hearings. I hope we all benefited from learning. Just to remind people, there is no vote today. The Health Policy Commission <clears throat> will be meeting on April 14th to review all this material and to make a, a final decision on our recommendation on whether we would uh, continue the benchmark at 3.1 or recommended that it go back up with a high point of 3.6. Um, we welcome any additional uh, comments. Please do it in writing and we will review them. Um, and um, let's see, David, do you have any final comments you wanna make? Um, just to say that all the materials from today's meeting will, will be on our website yeah. and, and please check out the, the CHIA report as well. Um, and I, I, I know you will agree here, Stuart, but just wanna say thank you uh, again to the Joint Committee on Healthcare Financing um, for participating in this hearing. Uh, really spectacular to have you here participating through the full three hours uh, and, and then some. Yes, I, I would yeah, like to end with that. I see both uh, Representative John Lawn and uh, Senator Cindy Friedman are still with us. Thank you so much. And hopefully we'll get a chance to see you in person in the near future and, uh, and the rest of you. So unless there's some burning issue uh, I know we're running a little over and I wanna thank everyone for staying with us. So if I don't hear anything to the contrary, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you.